historical events. What if they put Wolverine at the Stonewall riots? <laughs> that, oh my God! There's that X Men Origins Wolverine, like the opening credits for that. It shows him and Sabretooth like fighting in every war in America. Yeah, that's right, right. So we just got like in the, <laughs> through the Stonewall riots. <laughs> yeah, and they don't explain it. It's like, whoa, he was what? What? What's this now? I mean, they're they're both they're both prime bear material. They're so, bears. Yeah. There's no Wolverine. I mean, Wolverine, I mean, the, bear. The joke of him being named Wolverine was that, like, yeah, he's supposed to be, like, a big bear, but, like, Wolverine historically is, like, short. Right. And that's a joke that people always make. And they never did that in the movies because they wanted Hugh Jackman to seem tall and intimidating. So it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, whatever. Yeah. Bears, Wolverines, they're the same thing. Uh, essentially. Um but no, yeah, I think I think him and, and Liev Schreiber would have been great bear material at the Stonewall riots. <sighs> that's that's my one comic book. Like we couldn't have gotten him back. Liev Schreiber was a wonderful He's saber. a good actor. He was a wonderful yeah. saber tooth and I don't know what that means. That movie sucked. He it was. It was just he was a he was a great casting choice for that role. And he was wasted in that shit of a movie. You should text Ryan Reynolds and say, <laughs> hey. You know how you are like Deadpool again? Yeah. Make him Sabretooth again. Actually, don't do that because we don't need any more superhero movies. No, and the X-Men, the current X-Men series ended with fucking Dark Phoenix, which had a $10 budget, which was awful. So, And and also we have the added discomfort of knowing that X-Men is now owned by Disney. Yes. You know what else Disney owns? The Frozen 2. Well, yeah. But they're actually there's <laughs> we're gonna we gotta really narrow this down. I'm sorry. Do you want any hints? G- give me one. O- only a couple words though. Um, I don't want to make this too easy. Uh, Princess Mononoke. Oh, fuck. Um, DreamWorks. Do they own DreamWorks? Not yet. <laughs> okay. See, Princess Mononoke is not the right answer. They own the U.S. distribution rights. To Princess Mononoke. Oh, oh, darn. I guess I won't be getting that new car after all. But you know what they don't own? Yet. Never. They never will. Until they offer us like $15. The Spectator <laughs> Film Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And yes, we are not sponsored by Disney unless they'll give us money. No. Uh, no, I, they, I wouldn't take it. That That would be my dramatic... My, my one dramatic stand moment in life would be to not accept it. I would accept this. it, but I would accept it on condition that they destroy their company. <laughs> and then I'd be like, let's see how bad they want it. Let's see how bad they want this fine property. That is the spectator film podcast for us to shout out their star Wars resort <laughs> loot box <laughs> resort. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, Max, this domain name, I'm not going to brag. It's worth uh pretty dozens, penny. a pretty penny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally one pretty penny. Yeah. Oh, man. I'm so glad we're just back in action with these dumb fucking jokes. It's just perfect. That's why you guys come here. That's why I come here. I know that at the very least, because who else am I going to subject Max to my has horrible, a notebook. horrible humor? You have a notebook of dumb jokes. It's that called you my write. brain. Um, <laughs> that's all I have. In yes. There. Shitty movie trivia and dumb jokes. Yes. But uh, a movie that I have a lot of trivia and fun facts and I've grown up with and occupies a lot of space in my brain is the movie we're doing today princess mononoke by acclaimed director hayao mizaki a studio ghibli um this was my pick of course uh because as the spectator film podcasts resident weeb i need to inject anime into austin's life despite his many protests i just want to like clarify that resident weeb is not actually a title we we hold because i would be too embarrassed to be part of any <laughs> organization that actually well, you might want to check my office later because it's the plaque underneath my name, unfortunately. But that was your decision. <laughs> That's just like a you thing. But also, like, it totally makes sense that you would choose this movie. Yeah. Right. You're the one of the two of us. I don't know anything about anime. I'm not cool, kids. <laughs> I'm fucking ancient at this point. I don't know anything about anime. For the record, I'm older than Austin. <laughs> I barely know what a coomer is. I mean, come on. I'm... I'm just, I'm done. I'm done. When I thought of TikTok, I thought of Kesha. I don't know what you kids are <laughs> on about. But. Yeah, so I'm not cool. I don't know about anime. Max knows more about anime. Um, um, because I was not cool. I was. 
I was a, the biggest fucking dweeb growing up. Before it was cool to make TikTok videos of you and your friends Naruto running through the mall. I was actually Naruto running through the mall with headbands and just getting weird looks and getting told to stop by mall police. So I'd probably ask you to stop if you ran into me and you were trying to be Naruto. Yeah. Um, no. And like, I look back at myself now. Oh my God. There's so many things where like when you're young, you're just like, why can't adults be cooler? But now like at my job, when like teenagers come in in pa- like packs and just start like trashing the place, I'm just like, Oh man, fuck you guys. Yeah. Now you realize it's like, Oh, adults hate me. <laughs> <laughs> that version of me. They hate everything about me. <laughs> and I hate that version of me too. But no, I, I grew up loving anime and I have to attribute that to Studio Ghibli actually because as many people would I assume. Yes. Um, yeah. I saw Spirited Away when I was very young but that was not the first one I saw. I actually saw Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind first. Which is weird. Yes. Um, given the distribution stuff at the time. Well I believe it was because Spirited Away had just come out and like received a claim in the West. Right. Um, so they had finally made a bunch of their DVDs available. And um, can I just interrupt you to clarify for anyone who's not like a U.S. listener or even yeah. U.S. listeners who just weren't like Familiar. conscious at yeah. the time, which I barely was. But if you look at the release schedules, there's a bit of like a weird staggered thing going on between their release in Japan, Miyazaki's movies specifically. Um and uh, how they were eventually released in the U.S. In fact, that's a big, obviously, point of controversy with this movie, Princess Mononoke. But I, I which we will get into, yeah, later. I assume also it's a big thing of or point of discussion at least. But you know, difference between different dubbing and translation things going on between the Japanese version and the English version. Um, it took a lot to get these movies over here, and I'm under the impression that it was when they were doing it, they were still sort of. They didn't figure out like an infrastructure for bringing anime like that into the U.S. quite the same way that they might now. Um, so and it was it Miyazaki, was a little bit weird. The and Miyazaki's also notoriously very protective of his work. So of course, yeah. It was it was hard. To this day, he does not allow uh, any visual upload. Like you can upload clips of Disney movies to do like review purposes on if you upload clips of anything from Miyazaki's work for the most part, you risk getting that taken down and your channel on YouTube, getting copyright stricken. Oh, that's so. weird. I mean, I know they just side with claimants all the time anyway, but, but they're, they're notorious for it. Point but, taken. But, but regardless, I remember to this day of, re- uh, of renting uh Nausicaa of the Valley of the wind right. from my local library. And they still had a DVD section and watching that and falling in love with this weird sci-fi versus nature world that had a strange, bizarre, beautiful animation style that I had never seen. My parents encouraged it at the time because Spirited Away was being sung its praises and considered high art. So if I'm getting into movies by the same studio, that's good for a kid to enjoy. Saw Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke shortly after um, with my parents. I think they were a little put off by how violent Princess Mononoke was for how young I was when I saw it, but I I adored it and rewatched it into the ground. I've seen a lot of Ghibli's movies. Um, not all of them. There are a couple that I've missed out on, mainly due to people I trust having said that, like, yeah, you don't really need to watch this and the plot and visuals not really catching me and motivating me to watch it. But they were definitely formative enough for me to start getting into let's say less artistically motivated anime later on and becoming a gigantic naruto bleach one piece watching weep growing up um bleach it's don't worry about it okay um (laughs) you know what don't answer you're right but as I grew older, I, 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 I'll still watch a quality anime series every once in a while, but like it's not an essential part of my life right now. It's it, anime aesthetics in my idea are a tool and certain things, be it shows or video games or movies can utilize them effectively. And if they don't inherently make something better or worse than anything else, 
and it's not something I actively seek out now. Um, but I do appreciate them a lot. And I have to thank Miyazaki and by extension studio Ghibli for that. And when I have to say what my favorite studio Ghibli movie is, it would be princess Mononoke 10 times out of 10. Oh, it is your favorite. Yes. Okay. It, there are a bit of pacing issues toward the end of this movie, but other than that, I would say a, almost every char- major character in this movie is multifaceted. Yeah, multifaceted and interesting. Um, the animation style is beautiful. The world feels lived in and believable. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that part of it is based on actual Japanese history and they have this rich cultural yeah, well to draw from. But it it's just every aspect of this movie checks off a box for me as very well written female characters, which I know Miyazaki is in, insistent on without like doing an anime thing of weirdly sexualizing them. It's it, it really, I, I just adore this movie. I really do. I don't think it's necessarily studio Ghibli's best movie, but it is my favorite one by them. Right. Um, and I know you don't have, as an extensive experience with them. No. But. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely not um, a weeb. And uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, maybe I can attribute that to my highly Roman Catholic upbringing. Um. <laughs> to be fair, every uh, like anime style game that I've played ends with you uh, killing God with the power of friendship. So that's not what Catholics do. Uh, exactly. It's very anti-Catholic to kill God with the power of friendship. Yeah, so. you kill yourself. With the power of God. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no. Uh, so I grew up missing out on things like Pokemon. My parents thought it was stupid. They wouldn't let me watch it. Um, it's blasphemy. Not like that far, but like they were just like, this is not like dumb. You, they're not They're not evangelicals. They're just Catholics. Rung below. Yeah, they see someone having fun and they think it's stupid. They don't think <laughs> it's, it's probably like simple. you're going to hell for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, slight difference. Um, so, uh, I missed out on anime and, uh, though I suspect that I might've enjoyed many of these movies a great deal growing up, uh, and they would have been a sort of a big part of the movies and things that I watched as a young kid. Uh, I did not see a single studio Ghibli movie until I was in college. Boo. Um, I watched spirited away was the first one. Um, that's most people's entry point to be fair. Yep. And then I watched Porco Rosso. Such a weird one to include on the few that you've seen. That's my favorite one I've seen. It's a bizarre one. It doesn't, the movie kind of just like sort of doesn't end though. It's weird in that way. It's weird, but I like it more than both Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke. I watched that. Okay. So I watched Spirited Away in college, jumped to two months ago. That's when I watched Porco Rosso. And then I watched Princess Mononoke for the first time for this show. Um, and I know I had an impression of Princess Mononoke from what I had heard about it online. Like, I'm aware of Hayao Miyazaki pretty extensively. People love him. Yes. Um, to the point where part, probably part of the reason why I hadn't seen more of his movies up to this point is that sort of unhelpful but and sometimes inevitable reflex that I'll feel about certain directors where I lose interest in their movies because they seem so, um, I don't know, universally acclaimed. Yeah. Like, but, but in a specific manner, in my mind, I compare Hayao Miyazaki, at least the way people here in the U S respond to him in the same group as like Wes Anderson. People who like Wes Anderson will also like Hayao Miyazaki. Well, I and get that. Appreciate like, him in the same way because his movies are aesthetically pleasing, and people who like Wes Anderson movies certainly don't care about yeah good pacing or writing or it's like aesthetic in minutia yeah. as represented by minutia and unimportant things in the movie. The difference between Hayao Miyazaki, though, in the few movies of his his that I've seen, which again only those three. Uh, and Wes Anderson is that Hayao Miyazaki seems to be more capable of avoiding that trap of like fetishizing minutia where clearly he puts lots of detail into every single part of the movie he's making. That's why he animates them, right? Yeah. Uh, he just wants to create everything he's looking at from the ground up. Um, but he often finds very intelligent 
uh, and sophisticated ways to motivate those things. I, again, I haven't seen all his movies, but in the ones that I have seen, this is my experience with his movies. Um, he, he does not let details kind of like hang around for no reason. And I feel like there's plenty of amazing examples of this in this movie. Something we're going to talk about a lot during the commentary track is how this movie relates, uh, not only to, um, sort of discourse on like Japanese history and Japan's idea of its own history, but also like just literal archeological things. That's a big part of the backstory of this movie is how much research he did. Uh, people talking about how part of his big inspiration was just reading old volumes written by monks who were ever, I can't even remember, um, written like a millennia ago by people who are just like cataloging different plant species, talking about the environment, et cetera, et cetera. Right. This is the source of this movie, all these different cultural ideas building and forming this weird milieu, this idea that sort of grew over in his mind for like about 15 years before he produced this. So all these details do sort of uh, spark all these interesting associations. Um, the problem with those associations, Max, and we're going to get into my true response to the movie now, is uh, that uh, I think it's, it's so specifically Japanese. This might be the most culturally specific movie we've talked about on the show so far, um, which also I think makes it the most challenging movie we've prepared for so far on the show. And I just want to say like, and you could probably do an undergraduate class on all the historical reference points for this. We are not going to get all of it. And that's not even close. And that's something I should clarify uh, before we dive into this. Right. Which is actually against my protests we are doing the uh original japanese with english subtitles yes you this. you were thinking you would do it would be better to do the english dub yes um i i'm glad you're mentioning this yes i personally think that for english viewing audiences i i really don't think there's that much of a competition i think the english dub allows you to get full more fully engrossed in the world i think it gets points across without yeah, potentially alienating people with some strange yeah, cultural things that aren't vital to the plot, but might just make your skin crawl a bit. And I think some of the humor and jokes really kind of draw you in. They brought in Neil Gaiman to localize the script, which I, I think really shows and shines. Um, the only complaint I have is, they do have an all-star voice cast and some of them are trying a little too hard and it gets a bit goofy at points. Some of them are not trying hard enough. Yeah. I'm going to oh. say, but uh, someone's got to fucking slap Billy Bob Thornton, <laughs> get him to stop being like, Oh yeah. that's the deer God. Did you see the deer God over there? We're going to cut off his head. Yeah. I'll be back in a minute or so. Hey, is that gold? It's so like, okay, we'll get into that later. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but Jesus. But I, I personally do think that the uh, English dub is objectively better. So if any of our viewing public at home have not seen this movie, um, I, I would say this is another one of those movies that you should watch first on your own. Um, I, I do not think it's best enjoyed with Tweedledee and Tweedledum over here speaking over it for the first That's time. That's every movie. Yeah. That's every movie. We uh, there's a couple of shitty ones that it doesn't matter, in my opinion. You're right. Uh, Repo doesn't fucking matter at all. Oh, go fuck yourself. Don't <laughs> even watch Repo. <laughs> uh, Repo is the best movie we've ever done on the podcast. You know what? Even uh, if you're listening to just a Repo episode, it's too late. <laughs> the best scenario is just never hearing of it, never wandering into it on the internet. You just keep going your way. Why do you wound me like this, Austin? You, it's your choice to like it. I'm just saying. <laughs> Before I wounded you, you decided to like it. <laughs> but that's a different I conversation. Didn't Repo. Repo chose me. But I, I agree with you. It, this movie is is very rich in what so, it has to offer. And I so I this is mine. I'm not speaking for the Spectator Film Podcast or Austin, but in my humble opinion, I would highly recommend watching the English dub. But since we are going to be watching with subtitles anyway, because we always watch our movies muted. Right. Um, we figured it would be yeah, fine to just to do the Japanese with subtitles. Also, I fucking disagreed. Yes. I thought the Japanese one was better. 
Um, we have differing opinions on this. We'll talk about it in the commentary. I felt like there were certain things. I watched the English one first. When I watched the Japanese one, I liked the movie more than I did originally. And also I felt like it communicated things to me that I just did not just like, just totally missed it in the English one. And, uh, I watched the English one a little bit again, not all of it. Um, so maybe I would be wrong if I rewatched the English one, but I felt like the Japanese one, I started seeing things that I did not, that I felt like were inaccessible to me during the English one. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I will say though, I haven't really said my opinion on this movie. I do think this movie is good. Um, but I think it is more fascinating than it is good. Um, I think I would go back and forth between whether I like this or Spirited Away more. Um, but I will say that of all three Hayao Miyazaki movies that I've seen, Princess Mononoke is the one that I feel like I will have uh, the most sort of back and forth and sort of undetermined future relationship with. Like I watched this movie, we're going to talk about it. Uh, I feel like I could return to this movie in however long a time and have totally new insights. Like, I feel like this movie more so than the other ones is unresolved and it presents a tension in its subtext and what it's about in such a way that it, it produces new ideas that you can't sort of just get a grasp on in one sitting. And in that way, I think it's more interesting than both Spirited Away and Porco Rosso, which I feel like you can maybe wrap a, a tighter bow on. Um, that said, I, I do think it, it's good. Um, I have some problems with some character stuff that just make it less enjoyable to me. But at the same time, part of what keeps me interested in revisiting it uh, in the future is that cultural specificity and the knowledge that like that's just ground we can't make up <laughs> in a lot of ways. So it's like, man, there's so many details and associations that I would just never have access to that could totally change what I think about every little detail of this movie um, because he put so much effort into his homework for all this stuff um, that I think it really, it really pays off because now it's like this effortless, like you said, very deep well that you can keep returning to over and over again. Yeah. Um, so we both like it. I, I love this movie. I would go as far to say it, but I, so with that, I think it's going to be a much more positive episode of the spectator film podcast. It's going to be a very challenging movie to do, and I'm interested in how it's going to go. Um, but before we jump into the commentary track, I do want to get this out of the way where I've got a little book with me. Of course. He does. Um, it's Austin's weekly quote. Everyone get yeah. out your notes. Here's the thing. I wanted to get this out of the way in the introduction because I feel like trying to cram it in at the beginning would just be too much. There's a lot going on at the beginning. And this movie, like we said, communicates quite a bit in its minutia. So uh, it does not stop always to comment upon what is communicating in the little tiny details. It's up to you to pick them up. So if we're going to be talking about like that stuff, it's going to be hard to jump back and quote stuff like this. But the book I have with me is a book called The Samurai Films of Akira Kurosawa by a man named David Desser. And uh, this book is not directly related to or about this movie, obviously. Um, but I did want to quote a little tiny bit of it, uh, discussing a comparison that is often made between Akira Kurosawa's movies and just samurai movies in Japan in general, and the Western in the US. And the reason I'm bringing this up now is that I think it's a very useful entry point uh, into Princess Mononoke and how this movie is working, um, primarily as a piece of media that is about like a mytho mythologizing approach to the past, uh, which is a key part of both Westerns and samurai films, as different as they can be at times. Uh, I would not call this movie a samurai film, but I would call it part of the uh, Jedi Geki genre, which again, oh, by the way, I thought you were going to say Jedi for a second. I'm like, get out of here with your Star Wars bullshit. George Lucas was a weeb, wasn't he? No. He was. Because remember, Star Wars is based on Akira Kurosawa stuff. Was he a weeb? No. He's weird enough. He is weird enough, but... He loves tentacle things. He only loves one tentacle thing. That's not enough. Well, let's get back to this. <laughs> <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> so uh, the interesting thing about the introduction of this book, which even though it's about not about this movie, you can relate to it, is uh, the, the author, Desser, is talking about how... Uh, this type of genre movie, the one that mythologizes the past 
in such a way that it comments upon the present and helps explain the present is something that's a key part of both Westerns and samurai films, right? The Jedi Gaki film. And I was going to warn people about pronunciation. By the way, do not expect us to get us right. We're going to get it wrong. So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're just two white people in in outside New York, in Connecticut. God help us. Um, so we don't know how to pronounce anything. So the point is, you have the similarity where it's about mythologizing the past to understand the present. And in both the Western and the historical drama sort of genre in Japan, you see these movies mythologize the past in such a way to impose more of a dominant ideology on the present, at least in their cla classical period, especially with the Western. And part of what he talks about in the introduction of this book in this chapter is how that happens with Japan, which is a country that, or at least an island, that seems to have a lot of continuity culturally for many, many generations, which is not the case in America, where we constantly throughout the 20th century, through movies mostly, have been projecting ideology into the creation of like a national identity by mythologizing the past. Ourselves. Yeah, because America doesn't have a culture. It doesn't have a past. The only thing it's done is kick other people out and enslave people. That is its culture. So to be fair, we also did make a denim. <laughs> You're right. You're totally right. I, how could I fucking forget denim max? Um, that's really inexcusable of me. Um, but the thing with Japan though, is despite this cultural continuity, you also have major periods of intense change like the Meiji restoration, right? Which launches them sort of into the, uh, 20th century. And uh, when you're a country that's going to go undergo so many vast changes and it's sort of like topped with the cherry on top of a fucking atom bomb, uh, that's going to be weird. <laughs> um, especially because the end of World War II fo forces so many immense changes onto Japan so quickly. That's like, well, now what? The emperor's still here, but now he has to say he's not immortal, all this other stuff over like a liberal democracy now. And we're like fully integrated into American capitalism. It's weird changes, right? So that's a lot of what this movie is about, Princess Mononoke, is the idea of intervening in the mythology that is supporting the dominant ideas of Japan at the time uh, and showing parts of that mythology that are usually marginalized and sort of excluded from the image of Japan's past. And the, uh, let me see. Oh, the other, the thing I wanted to quote here, though, is more specific than that. It's about the idea that when you set something in the historical mytho mythological past in this way, uh, the audience is constantly confronted by the fact that time has passed between now and then. And uh, just to quote Desser here, uh, he says, the obsolescence of the samurai as a warrior class during the Tokugawa period era, par pardon me, is one of the key structural underpinnings of the samurai film. Filmmakers screen seeming unwillness, un yeah, unwillingness to situate their samurai dramas in more violent uh, Momoyama or Muromachi period indicates the function of the samurai genre fulfills to the Japanese mind. The audience must confront at every moment the film is on screen, both the obsolescence of the eventual destruction of the way of life of which the hero is a part. It puts the hero of the film in the curious position of being unable to succeed no matter the, what course of action he takes, a point to which I will return. And he talks about that later. But again, he's talking about why they set these samurai movies in a period of time in which the samurai is ultimately irrelevant. Similar thing happens for the Western. Every part of the Western is the fact that the gunslinger is a breed of person that's going to die out because we're eventually going to spread to the West and there's going to be no more gunslingers, right? So all Western movies are sort of in some they, way. They have a predetermined destination, even yeah. if the movie itself is not going to reach that is the basic point. Absolutely. We know that Japan, even if this is a slightly mythologized version of it, isn't going to stay... In this beautiful part man, part nature god utopia forever. We know that it's going to be completely paved over at some point. But even if that's the case, our characters still have hope. And I think that's kind of what makes this movie... It's inspiring. a tension yeah. at the ending. Yeah, which but is it's, why it's interesting because it wants you to continue some sort of thought process about this. But it's still inspiring and hopeful. And yeah. 
It puts me in a good mood. There, again. It's not overdetermined. There's yes. contingency for change. But yes, yeah, so exactly what you're saying. I think that's a great entry point for people in this movie, especially if you're an American thinking about it in that way, comparing it to, you know, mythological fiction about the the frontier of the old West. The idea that everything in this movie, there's the predetermined notion that it's going to fucking disappear because of who Japan is when this movie was made and then because of it. Let's just hope that there's not a predetermined notion that you're going to be disappointed by this podcast. So Ooh, that's, that's, that's a high <laughs> bar. That's a high bar, Max. Okay. Well, we'll see anyway. Let's go. All right. G kids. What does that mean? means ghibli kids now uh we talked about this but it's pronounced ghibli or ghibli um the common internet thing is that it's an italian word for an african wind <laughs> used by a japanese animation company and we're two american idiots so it doesn't fucking matter in the can, long run can, can i call it ghibli if you want studio I, ghibli i i usually just go with ghibli um right but we're treated to a title, an open title. I was going to say immediately just this amazing, like amazing display of animation right off the bat. And this movie does use a uh, 3d for fast movement later on, but you mean CGI yeah. animation. Yeah. But, uh, I think this is a testament to, I mean, all of Miyazaki's and Ghibli's work to a degree are a testament to the power of hand-drawn animation. Just absolutely as in art form and how utterly impactful amazing and beautiful they can be and also like just opening in that way there's a few things about that opening to discuss but it it does feel like it is really setting the grand stage opening your any sort of big movie with like oh nice what like big scale location shot like that to just capture a sense of grandeur is just like an excellent move Weirdly, one of the key relationships in the movie is Ashitaka and Yakul. Cool. Yeah, which I say weirdly because this movie's sort of uh, approach to having human and animal relationships is different than a lot of movies yeah. <laughs> that you see, which is part of what I find so interesting about it. I think you could discuss this a lot in reference to some things we've mentioned on the show before, stuff like Donna Haraway, which there's scholarship that I'll mention probably later on that does. Um, the idea of what Donna Haraway talks about where, um, I don't know if she would call herself a post-humanist, but the idea of totally rethinking our relationships to like other animals, right? Well, it's interesting. In, like an academic way. Because, uh, Yakul's role diminishes a little bit in the later part of the movie. Right. Mainly because he gets injured. But in my mind, because I hadn't seen this movie in years, I remember him dying, but not a lot of people die in this movie. Nope. Not a lot. And that... Like, despite it being one of the, I mean, it's not, it's no grave of the fireflies, obviously. <laughs> um, but it is sort of just like, despite the fact that it is violent and grim and has a bad view of humanity at times, it, the movie does have a very sort of optimistic tone for a lot of it. And that's reinforced with the fact that a lot of characters just, they persist throughout the movie, even if in traditional I guess more Western narratives, they would be killed as punishment for their sins or aggressions earlier on in the plot. It's it's interesting in its sort of approach towards violence as a means of like resolving any sort of part of this conflict, right? Yeah. Which is also part of why we could get into this later, but part of why I st start to find the movie less, less interesting in its second half. I can't fucking talk today, Jesus. Um, has to do with its relationship towards passivity and especially how it's embodied in our main character, Ashitaka. Um, but I think there's still a lot of arguments you could sort of uh, offer in sort of like a devil advocate sort of way to that. Talking about how sort of Miyazaki looks towards violence as something that um, relates to the conflict that's going on here and how it's not something that he really views as a legitimate solution in any sort of way. Um, it can be effective in the short term, but it's not going to help you out with your problem in the long term at all. I don't even know if I would say the movie goes that far. Um, definitely not long term though. Uh, and I think 
I think Iron Town is the point I was trying to make there, where them carving out their own niche and having more advanced weapons than everybody oh, else has for given sure. them a a niche in the wild. Yeah, but it's not going to help them. <laughs> I think it's perfectly embodied almost yeah. in the detail we just saw where um, there's these great touches that, again, just examples of homework being done. Yeah. You're seeing the way that uh, that Ashitaka uses his bow. What is the first thing he uses it for? Nothing at all related to violence whatsoever. He to- uses it as a means of communication with Yakul. He shoots a thing to get him to move, <laughs> right? It's very interesting. He totally rethinks all these different details that um, in similar movies to like this would be used in more conventional ways. I think what you're talking about with the violence, especially is despite the fact that this movie, I'm sure too many people will discuss it as a movie that seems surprisingly violent for being an animated movie, at least um, this movie's attitude towards violence is very much opposed to what you would usually expect from a similar type of historical drama from Japan and especially the more specific genre of samurai movies. Speaking of which, I commented yesterday that I, I give props to that girl for being ready to fucking stab a demon God. Her but also, <laughs> also like, let's not go near the demon God. Uh, yeah. You need like a very long sword or knife. Like maybe let's not go near it. That's my suggestion. But what you're bringing up there also raises a very interesting question that I think is fascinating about this opening sequence, which is very well done, I think. Um, There's great sense of mystery going on here, right? Where it's like, what's happening so far? Um, I really sort of gravitate towards thinking about how this community of people, the Amishi tribe, which we'll talk about, uh, and why they're important that Miyazaki decided to use this community of people as like the starting point for this story. Um, I really do mull over like how much they're aware of or take for granted about everything that just happened. Obviously we're talking about how the fact that they avoid violence, but the other side of that is that Ashitaka, the first thing he thinks to do when this weird spider demon thing is coming near him is try to talk to it. Yeah. Try to tell it to calm down. Dude, it's okay. We're not trying to hurt anybody. Don't, don't, don't hurt us. And the way that this sort of matriarchal, um, shamanistic old woman sort of does this, this ritualistic move of like addressing the boar as it's dying. Also, this speaks to like an idea of tradition and understanding of the world around them that does not, they're not surprised by this boar, this demon boar, right? They take this for granted about the world around them. Um, and I think it speaks a lot to how they relate to nature, which is again, the big thematic dichotomy of this entire movie, man versus nature. Um, but not in the most straightforward way that you usually get, especially if you compare this to other movies released by like Disney, U U S movies that are kind of similar like this. It's not Fern Gully. It's not like, it's not like avatar. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's just stupid because like I said, it's not Fern Gully. It's the same movie. <laughs> it is the same movie. Yeah. You joke, but it's the same thing over and over again. She's playing uh, Jax to determine the fate. Honestly, how cool would that be if you could do that? That's the thing, though. I used to be like in my like the height of my obnoxious atheist face. It's right. Just like all of this stuff is stupid. But like I have a lot of friends who do like tarot readings and whatnot. And I'm just like. I'm not going to base my life choices on this, but that's kind of cool. Honestly, you do you. You just need to to get past the annoying atheist thing. You just, well, Tarot, I don't associate with religion anyway, I guess. Yeah. But it's like the key to that is just explaining that Tarot can be used as like anarchistic <laughs> political subversion. And then it's like, oh, okay. You mean we get to be like subverting things and use this as an aesthetic? Well, that's not actually how it's used by a lot of people, but that's this whole other conversation. But Max, this is an important scene. It is. Uh, And this was a key point of argument between us about which version to do, the uh, Japanese version or the English dub, because uh, this was the scene that I was watching this in the Japanese version with the subtitles where I felt like I got something from this scene that I totally did not get from the English one. Uh, Even if it does wind up being, if you look at the transcripts, 
quite similar. I felt like the way in which it's just expressed here is just different. Um, and as somebody, okay, go on with the point. You're trying well, to I was just going to say that what's about to happen here is that Ashitaka is going to be told he is going to die because he's cursed because he touched the demon boar. Yes. And he's going to have to go out, leave the tribe, leave their homelands if he wants to potentially address whatever caused this boar to be a demon. It's still a mystery at this point. And uh, if he wants to have any hope of saving himself, this is what he has to do. He has to go on this journey. Of course, in, cust- in a cust- according to the laws of this tribe, once he leaves, he can never return. He's their prince, though, so that's a bit of a problem. Uh, we're going to see him uh, cut off his top knot yes, in a moment. Our last prince must cut his hair and leave. Yes. And now, bitter fate. The youth who was one day to lead us must journey far to the west. But, um, which we know this is going to be an adventure movie. So we understand that he's going to succeed. Oh, I love that detail of the guy covering his eyes behind him. Yeah. But I guess the point I'm just making is that what's happening right here in this moment is that everyone in this under room sort of has an unspoken understanding that the tribe is going to be destroyed. Now they're not going to survive the fact that their leadership structure has now been destroyed. He was supposed to carry them into the next generation, right? He has to go now just yep. for, and he did nothing of his own. He did nothing wrong. Because he did what he needed to do. Because he saved the tribe from destruction. Yes. Um, because he saved it, it will be destroyed anyway. So, yeah, what were you going to say about that? I was going to say, as as a weeb, where I've had to deal with the uh, subs versus dubs argument for over a decade. <laughs> okay. Um and normally people will be just like, oh, no, you have to watch the original with subtitles because it's that's the original intention and you don't want. And Americans have had a bad history for at least anime series of like getting really shitty dubs that change the meaning of everything completely. Right. Um, but <laughs> but um, I think a lot of that has to do with our, the way our brain processes information, because like you said, if you look at the transcript, it's portraying the same information to a large degree. But I think that by having it out there and you reading it and incorporating it that way, it might've just hit you differently. Like a self-fulfilling prophecy almost Yeah, situation. That's possibly true. I guess it just, I understood while watching the Japanese version of this, more of what just happened, which is even more significant if you have the understanding of Japanese history that we tried to gain a little bit of in our research for this. Um, do you want to talk about right now why it's significant that they chose to make uh, Ashitaka the prince of this Amishi tribe? Um, I mean, this is a nice and slow part of the movie, so why not? Great vistas here, yeah. yeah. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know, the Amishi tribe are a tribe, they're like an ethnic group that occupied a certain part of Japan a long time ago, uh, slightly prior to this period, actually. Um and I have a quote in a 500 book. 500 years. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, that's because the emperor, apparently, everybody thought they were wiped out in the, when the emperor waged war against them. And that's like the last small remaining bastion of them. But yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, um, no, you're correct. Uh, this Technically, this takes place in the Muromachi period, mm-hmm. right? Uh, this is slightly after um, the more sort of historically well-documented accounts of I guess Yamato would be the name, uh, <laughs> the more institutional Japanese government that would come to dominate and homogenize everything. Uh, they would go on raids and sort of fight these different tribes of Amishi people. Um, and it is, I hesitate to compare it in many ways to, Oh geez. To, Oh, his arms going crazy. Um, <laughs> that blew my mind when I was a kid and I saw that. The fact the that he destroyed it, destroyed his arms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just how, like almost how casually it goes. It's just like his arm just flew off. But yeah, I hesitate to compare the Amishi tribe to um, people like, you know, Native American tribes here in the U.S. because I'm sure there's a great deal of specificity that's different. Um, but I see the same mechanism at play, the same sort of colonialist mechanism where it's not just we're going to destroy your tribe, we're going to homogenize you, we're going to erase uh, your language, we're going to erase your culture. Um, and there's a number of different groups of people that seem to have 
experienced this with Japan. I know that the one that still somewhat exists today in a very, very, very limited capacity is the I knew people. Um, although I believe they refer to themselves as something else, but I can't quite recall what it is. Um, but they, a thing that happens with this group of people, the Amishi, is that they basically exist in historical record, which is why if you read about the making of this movie, you're going to find that Miyazaki and uh, his team of collaborators at Studio Ghibli had to sort of explore this task of imagining the sort of um, uh, the gaps that they had in their understanding of the Amishi because most of those historical records that survived were written by <laughs> biased colonizers, basically, right? Yeah. The emperor and uh, the institutions. But the quote I have here um, from Bo from a book called, what is the name of this book? Hold on. The name of the book is Princess Mononoke, Understanding Studio Ghibli's Monster Princess, edited by Reina Denizen. And I'm going to include all this in the show notes. It's a pretty solid book. There's lots of different essays in here from different people. Um, oh, whoops. Here's another, like, what What were you going to say? I was going to say, I found the quote. I finally got it. Okay, go. Okay. So the quote I was just going to say about the Amishi, um, they're established in the film as the Amishi, the Northern tribe of Japan's main Island Honshu, which resisted the Yamato emperor during the subjugation campaign of the Nara based Imperial court between 744 and 811. But even after that suppression effort, a large part of the Amishi's land was still not imperial, under imperial control. So this occurs after that. He's one of the last remaining Amishi tribes, right? Um, much like nature, much like uh, uh, San, right? These are parts that parts of Japan's history that are about to be glossed over and destroyed by the institution. And furthermore, like destroyed in memory, they're going to exist on more mythological terms, which I find very interesting um, because it sort of relates to an idea of like the, these sort of animistic, uh, I would say like potentially Shinto-esque. There's a lot of people talking about Shinto's influence on this movie. Um, the idea of these ancient nature gods that sort of pass more definitively into a realm of myth because the ritual and the sort of cultural institution that supported these gods is destroyed by a more dominant colonial culture. So we lose our personal connection to them. But yeah, what were you going to say about this? <sighs> Billy was, Bob Thornton? Yeah, Billy Bob Thornton. Um, I do love how his character is just like, because we were talking about spoilers, if you ignored all our warnings and are watching this for the first time with us. There, are, there is no true villain to this movie, I would say, or complete villain. Yeah. But on a on a rating scale, he is probably the most evil character in the movie. Um, and I, I, I do just love how masterfully everything is set up, how, like, he forcibly inserts himself into Ashitaka's life. He forcibly... He looks like he's helping him. He just makes the woman take the gold for him but it also puts his life in danger it also yeah. forces him to be indebted to him and then he just just passively like oh i know who you are i know where i took i know the general idea of where your tribe is yeah from yeah and don't fuck with me or <laughs> well that's that's like the very deep implication hidden in everything yeah. he does and i do totally agree with you that he's the most closest to definitive evil that you yeah. see in this um, almost to the point where you might argue that this movie lets him off the hook a little bit. Because well, yeah, that's he, the thing. Nobody dies. <laughs> yeah, he's totally knowledgeable about everything he's doing. This is a beautiful shot. I love this atmosphere of these uh, light rays, these light beams coming through the trees. But no, um, I think his name is Jigo, yes. right? Uh, most cynical character in the movie by far. And I do not think it's a coincidence that he meets up with Amishi and us as an audience, or I'm sorry, Ashitaka yeah. and us as an audience in a marketplace during a transaction, he is the most cynical because he's the most crassly exploitative of everything going on. The fact that he knows the forest dear God is real. And the fact that he's skeptical that it would help the emperor attain immortality at all. Yet he still wants to do it. 
because he would get gold. <laughs> Ultimate cynicism. Yeah. yeah. And that's really what, what it is, is that the cynicism and the exploitation of the natural resources go hand in hand. And of course, the thing it also goes hand in hand with is the displacement uh, and destruction of communities like the Amishi. That's the really fascinating thing about this movie is how it sort of builds all these different communities uh, alongside the sort of dichotomy of man versus nature. Basically, the two halves of this movie are kind of like repetitions. In the first half, we're going to see man, right? But we're going to see different communities of man. It's not going to be one homogenous group. They're all going to be different. They're going to have different objectives, right? And you could say that Jigo isn't even really a community, but he's like a representative of one. He's a representative of the Buddhist monks, which, as we learn learn later on in the movie, are apparently all fucking assholes. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I don't know much about Buddhist monks, but uh, I guess that Jigo, at least. I, I assume And again, the other ones that we see who try to kill Ashitaka with poison darts and stop Are them. those monks? Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> um... No, but uh, here we're introduced to one of the most interesting uh, communities, which is Iron Town. Yes. And, of course, the wolves and the titular Princess Mononoke. Uh, she's my favorite character in the movie, not going to lie. But she's I think she's the most multifaceted. You can understand where she's coming from for the most part. And just, I would say, yeah, she's probably out of the main characters, the second most evil after Jigo, but what really out of the main ones? Yeah. Well, there's not that. No many. way. I'd say Iboshi is way more manip manipulative and bad than San. No, that's what I'm saying. Oh no. I thought you meant princess Mononoke. As oh no. Abo Aboshi is my, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, she just to clarify. Yeah. Lady Aboshi appeared on screen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Got our wires crossed there. Yeah. No, Lady, no. Abo Lady Aboshi is my favorite character in this movie. And I think it's going to be interesting to talk about that too, because one of the things people talk about with Aboshi is how sympathetic she truly is, but it's yeah. really like she again is equally cynical to, to, uh, Jigo. Not that <sighs> what? it's less cynical though. Jigo's purely in it for money and that's personal true. You're game, right. You're right. Where she's just as knowledgeable of what yes. she's doing. She does have something she's fighting for more so than him. But ultimately, what she's fighting for is still just as exploitative in a different way. She does not, she does not sort of um, extend her sympathy towards San and nature in the same way that, that Ashitaka does. Yes. And furthermore, I think there's a very strong, um, I know we're really, in, when I say this, I'm injecting more current politics into this potentially from the U S but I get a very strong, like imperialist white feminist vibe from lady Aboshi where in case we haven't like really discussed it yet, it's the idea that the iron bullet inside the boar God that turned him into a demon and killed him comes from lady Aboshi. And that when she's confronted with it, she says tough shit. Yeah. I did that, but whatever. I did that. Are you going to kill me? Yeah. You're, you're entirely warranted to want to kill me for that. I'm sorry about that. You can try to kill me at least. Yeah, go yeah, for it. Yeah. Um, and what a way to introduce our female lead, by the way. Yeah, probably the most famous image from yeah. the movie. I do like how Moro has two tails. It's interesting. Again, just another piece of, like a little detail that I wonder is like very specific to Japanese. Is that a reference to something? I have no idea. I will tell you that a lot of the minor animals in this are surprisingly um, interesting references. A lot of people will talk about how Yakul is actually... Uh, hey, I get the Kododamas. Yeah, the little egghead things. Uh, a lot of people will talk about how Yakul is actually like an iteration of what we would call a red elk or an Irish elk, Yeah, which despite their name spanned all across Eurasia. Um, and apparently we're larger than a moose. Which is horrifying to think of. Oh yeah, well, I was I was telling you I've been watching a lot of uh, like old like Ice Age nature documentaries to keep myself sane. Yeah. In the quarantine. Oh, you were talking to me about the sloths. Yeah, there's giant ground sloths and whatnot, and it's just like there's so many animals that I'm just like, God damn it! I wish we weren't fucking assholes and hunted everything to extinction. Or but, even just like just don't go on that island and get them sick. Yeah. What's that bird that lived on like fucking Madagascar that was like 40 feet tall? I don't know. There's I, like a colossus bird or something like that. 
I brought up the terror birds, but those are, those were like half the size. Yeah. Not even, they're like not even close. There was another huge bird like that off an Island in New Zealand. I believe that was survived even longer, but yes. we destroyed it too. Uh, Why can't we just leave them alone? A lot. Most good studio Ghibli movies have tiny little cute things, but the Kodamas are absolutely amazing. <laughs> they're, they're that like, is true. That's a big motif with them, right? Is yeah. tiny little nippers that run around. You got those like spirited away, tiny little charcoal yeah. blips. Um, I don't know if there's any in Porco Rosso. I can't remember. I don't think so. No, P- Porco there, Rosso might be an exception. There's tiny little floof balls in uh, My Neighbor Totoro. Um, they got Italians in my, in Porco Rosso. But yeah, it's, it's a common thing. I, I, I love the Kodamas. But the interesting thing about this scene and the Kadamas, we were talking about this yesterday when we were preparing for this movie, uh, is how this sequence has no narrative point to it. If this was just about the plot, we could just get to where they're going. Yeah. Right? So what is the point of the scene? Uh, I, I feel like it's about introducing, again, these different communities that they're building. These two soldiers that Ashitaka has just saved, they're kind of like our second view of the community of Irontown. And how their ideology is a little bit different from the Amishi. Um, And I think the interesting thing that we noticed in this scene while talking about it is how in almost every community of various different people we see in the movie, almost all of them. Actually, I'm going to say all of them. I don't think we see one where they don't acknowledge this. All of them acknowledge and sort of understand that there is a mystical, semi-religious presence in the woods right? They all recognize the legitimacy of the existence of this dear God, right? When this guy sees the Kadama, this soldier, he freaks out, but it's because he has like an understanding of like, I don't know, he's superstitious about it. All it's the myth- not all of the mythical nature things are out to kill them. Basically. That's what he thinks. Right. But it's the difference between like being like, Oh, they're out to kill me. And wait, these things exist. Yeah. All, everybody in this movie acknowledges that they exist. So the difference between all these different human communities ultimately is that they exist on the type of like continuum from one end to the other uh, in terms of how they relate to the nature around them with and Jigo are, being the most exploited. Yeah, thing. but there are also some that like they're minor communities that we see in the movie, but there are some that like we are so far removed. They don't care like the Shogun's forces that attack Iron Town later. They don't give a fuck about that. They're, oh, they don't even have a representative yeah. in the movie. Yeah. They're they're just there to take the iron from Iron Town. Yeah. And yeah. I appreciate that too. Um, and you have the Emperor who's so far removed, we don't even see representatives from him, basically. I love this shot. Yeah. Uh this entire sequence is very interesting. Eat shit, Bambi. This is the best scene of a deer walking in animated history. I think Miyazaki does a legitimately impressive job, like creating like a type of weird religious experience in this little like lake that he finds in the woods where these huge trees, um, which I was reading that Hayao Miyazaki had based off of like an extinct redwood. species of, yeah, not redwood, evergreen or everwood, whatever, evergreen trees. Okay. I don't know if they're redwood, a big fucking tree that was around in Japan, apparently at a certain point in its history, uh, but went extinct after they turned more towards rice agriculture and they needed to clear land for rice. Um, And also there's lots of, you know, location scouting done for this and real life reference points in different parts of Japan uh, that sell the realism of it, but they walk into this clearing in the way that time sort of slows down in the different cuts. And they do this weird, like slow zoom. And then you see, this image of the deer God for the first time before you even know what you're looking for. You just see this deer with like a dozen antlers on its head. And you're like, what the fuck is that? And the fact that it's gone in a, in a flash is like, I don't know, something about it feels so legitimately uh, spiritual that I, I feel like so impressed that he was able to get that on animation. You know what I mean? It's not even seeing it like, live action for real with your own eyes. He just, he completely created this spiritual type scene out of complete artifice. Here we see the ironworks. 
Good old Iron. I, I call it Iron Town because that's what it's called in the English dub. So it's stuck yeah. with me all these years. Um, um I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the uh, Japanese word. Yeah. Um, it's like tar- tar- bar. <laughs> this is why I don't do it. Um, Tick tock on the clock. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Kesha is queen here. Kesha is the voice of our generation and deserves to be treated as such. And I'm not joking on that statement. So I could take our lever. Um, but anyway, the thing that's interesting about that, you're, we're talking about language convention, right? Yes. Um, little detail that's probably worth mentioning is that, uh, Hayao Miyazaki created his own words for describing certain things. They call the demons like a Tartara Ishigami or something. Um, a Tatara Shinigami. Shinigami is the Japanese word for God of death. Um, okay. It's yeah. something along those lines where he, he sort of creates, I don't even know if Japanese works this way, a type of portmanteau, it seemed to me. Yeah. Where he, he works the Tartara part of the word into the demon part yeah. to sort of indicate that they are related, which is interesting linguistically. They, were, they also refer to the dear God later on as Shinigami as well. Oh, okay. Because it is a God of life and a God of death, but yeah, it is. And in a really interesting way in, in equal measure because it's a life of God and death more so as a way of being like a God of balance. Yeah. The natural cycle. Yeah. Like we'll see much later on that when you have the, you have Moro and Okoto yeah, fighting, he basically just shows up to grant them both death and, release from the rage and violence that they're inflicting on each other. Yeah. It's not about individualism. It's about, yeah. it's about like harmony with the world around you as far as the dear God is concerned. And both of them basically were like, had been supposed to die at that point. Yeah. Like Moro had been wounded since the start of the movie and Okoto like had basically sentenced his entire yeah. race to death. And she's more aware of it than Okoto yeah. in some ways, or at least Okoto. Well, Okoto is, was aware of it, but he was just sort of he's like, a bore. He's just like, <laughs> I'm going to fucking run at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I, you mentioning that is interesting too, because I think it is perhaps comparable to the role that um, Ashitaka must learn to embrace here, where he basically in the second half of the movie chooses no sides whatsoever. Yeah. Um, just well, in the same way that the dear God kind of does not choose sides because it's not about choosing sides. Really. It's, it's about preserving the world, you know, and when you have environmental cataclysm, it's the world that's in danger. It's not about like, sides it doesn't matter what your side you're what side you're on it makes no difference at all no toki's one of my favorite minor characters in this movie <laughs> she's interesting yeah and in another movie the all the women of iron town like it, i guess they're the closest thing to what in animes would be called fan service in this movie because they wear very loose kimonos and just sort of like have their boobs hanging out a lot of the time, but it's like, I did notice that the first time watching this where I'm like, she has cleavage in a way that I did not want to expect, I guess, but it's almost like not in a sexual way. No, all. it's like, it's after, like part of her character, which is kind of impressive. And yeah, it's like all of them do because they work in hot iron factories and just basically need your to clothes lose. needs to breathe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's never really drawn attention to, <laughs> it's just like, eh, that's what they wear. Yeah. I do appreciate those uh, little details. Um, obviously, Irontown is a very interesting part of this movie. And it's a key part because it's it, like the fact of Lady Eboshi being who, who she is. Yes. And the fact of this being like a refuge is very important. The, re- the refuge part is the most interesting to me because you said before that she has something to fight for, but it's against nature. And that's true. But also, it's not just like, oh, well, man needs a place to live. It's more that, like, these are people who have been cast out of the world of men. They're women who don't fit into the traditional roles that are assigned to them. They're not passive women. They make a point of saying that they're all very strong-willed and don't want to be commanded by the men. Um, We don't really get a feel for the regular men in Iron Town, but they are almost subservient to their wives. There's an interesting interesting back and forth there's certain lines they say where it's like lady aboshi spoils them 
Yeah. And it's like, does she really spoil them? No. I mean, I don't, I don't know if she really spoils them. She give, Maybe she trusts them more than you. She gives them harder work than the men, honestly. They have to work in the iron bellows when they say their shifts last four days long. Like That was a weird line. I'm like, yeah. how is that possible? But also like... Well, you, you see some of them sleeping and resting, so I'm assuming they take they take turns and well, then they get days off. The but. interesting thing about it is again, something that's interesting about how this movie approaches labor. I feel like a lot of Miyazaki's movies have an interesting idea of labor. And uh, a lot of people will probably link that into some sort of biographical analysis about how he was like leader of a labor union when he was younger. Um, he's definitely someone who feels like he, he identifies himself as like an eco Marxist. Yes. Feminist. But can I finish my thought? Real oh quick? yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, and then later on, we're about to find out that the people she has in her in a most sanctum, she trusts with her most like advanced plans to make new rifles, to push iron town even further. It is crafty how she does that. Um, it's a secret because no one will go near a leper. Yes. They're all lepers. Yeah. So she's created a society of outcasts purely. So, I th- like I said, I think it's less of the fact that it's just like all oh, these it's it's humans versus nature. They're inherently incompatible. I think it's that she finally found a place that humans hadn't claimed yet. She made a town for outcasts and people like her. And it was finally doing well. And now nature is trying to reclaim it. And she feels that she has every bit as yeah, much of a right to that land that nature does. Yeah. And you're up. It's perfectly okay to disagree with that. And nature was there first and whatnot, but like you can see where you're, she's coming from and she's an incredibly sympathetic villain because of that. Well, it's not merely sympathetic. It's like, try, how do you debate? Like, yeah. we don't know anything about her backstory. Was she, she buys forced into a brothel? Did she kill people to escape a brothel? Like, what is her backstory? She, we know she'll kill people yes. in like an instant. She and has we, no problem with it. And she buys women who are being sold as slaves and yeah. gets them to live in iron. We town. know she'll kill a an animal god yes. without blinking, right? <laughs> Try debating <laughs> someone who potentially lived an entire existence that is unseen to you. Uh, where they were like abused and oppressed horribly, I assume to the point where they accept violence readily. Try explaining to them how they're wrong about doing this. Yes. Uh, in creating a society where the first time in their life, it's not merely that they're like not being abused, but they finally have a chance to be in charge, especially because I do think she sees herself as a revolutionary, right? There's a really great quote about that too, where Miyazaki in thinking about this character talked about how if it was a man, it would just be sort of like another man, even if the society was the same. Whereas if Lady yeah. Eboshi is a woman, now it's like a political statement that she's doing this, right? But she is pushing things forward. We see forces of a supposedly powerful shogun if he has enough forces to want to challenge the emperor. Um, although, to be fair, in my, my knowledge of Japanese history, it doesn't take a lot to want to become the new emperor. Right. Um, but... And they do mention the Amishi say the emperor's shogun's fangs are, yeah. are slipping or something. Yes. So um, he's uh, on the wane. But at, regardless, we don't see anybody else have gunpowder. Everybody else is still fighting with bows and arrows and swords. You do get the impression she's a strategically yeah. like vi- valuable position. And she somehow seems to be the only one who either has enough money or is able to import guns from China. Yeah and knows enough about their inner workings to improve upon their designs. Like, yeah. Uh, and also just to add on everything you're saying to bring it back to this idea of the like historical drama genre, we've already mentioned a lot of these movies are not almost all of them are not about these people. They're about samurai. Yes. <laughs> They're about samurai very quote, like close to the top of the center of power. There are so many movies about like Toshiro Mifune being like the best samurai and like the most trusted samurai to the point where it's like he's just at the top. Everything's yes. at the top. It's like a bunch of different people and it's just their like court drama going back and forth almost. And toward Did- the end of the reign of the samurai, they weren't like armor clad wearing amazing warriors anymore. It was just a hereditary position that you got a government stipend for. Yeah. In different eras, their like responsibilities changed. They became like statesmen. Yeah, basically. Um, 
No, that's 100% true. And uh, everything about this movie, I feel like it's it was very interesting to learn about the gulf between my experience as an American watching this and being totally oblivious of the cultural implications, really. I would understand that this is not like other samurai or historical drama movies that I've seen from Japan. But truly knowing that, like, this is about this movie stars and is exclusively populated with the last people <laughs> that this type of movie would ever be about prior to this. Yeah. An ethnic group that is exists only in the historical record as like, as like the enemy. In fact, in some of the reading that I have in quotes that I'll post in the show notes, uh, research shows that mostly they're referenced in animal like terms. So they're the bad guys in the most generic way. Yeah. Um, for these types of movies. And yet there are leads. And also And we the, do get a note that apparently she does that the lepers might be joking. Also, Ashitaka's about to go super saiyan. But joking about what? Like they're they're smiling, laughing, but they're saying that she wants to rule the country. Yeah. And we don't know if that's a just like, ha, huh, she could never, but like, even if it is a joke, yeah, like she might on like she might have a good position to if the emperor collapses, but or aspiration to, yeah, she's in the point is that she's sitting on a very advantageous position if she can keep hold of it, which is why she's got people so busy manufacturing guns, yes. right. And again, the very interesting thing about this to me is the manner in which uh, the sort of the political stance she's taking as revolutionary is still something that displaces other people. This movie's all about displacement and transference of like damage to a location and to the land and to nature onto other people. And I think it, it to go back to the opening scene, Max, it really does begin with the curse itself. Um, there's an essay in that book I mentioned, uh, the Princess Mononoke book put out by Bloomsbury, um, that talks about sort of like, I believe the term they use is transcorporeality. Um, the idea of like the continuum between human and animal bodies in this. And it begins with the curse, right? You touch the demon worm things and it's going to infect you. The damage done to the environment is damage that can be transferred to you. It's like a contagion. You're not like discreet or separated from the damage that's being done to the environment. Um, so when these people exploit the natural resources, uh, this movie has a very clever way of always bringing it back to other communities of humans. And then back again on themselves too. True. Um, the same essay argues a point later on, something we'll talk about in the movie, the idea that, you know, Ashitaka doesn't really take any sides in this conflict in a way that I personally find a little bit dry and boring. Um, but they make a very interesting point about how that sort of speaks to the idea of the global nature of um, environmental catastrophe, where it's like, again, sides do not matter in the face of environmental destruction. When you're facing something that's kind of like an apocalyptic event, it sort of destroys any sort of binary opposition you can set up in your mind and maintaining binary opposition up until that point might actually reinforce the doom that you're bringing upon yourself. Because if you understand a more nonlinear and open view of the world in which you have a sort of connection between yourself and other people and the world around you and other animals, you cannot in good conscience uh, sort of claim them as property or, um, exploit the world around you in the same way to begin with. Well, what do you think of this scene? This seems kind of weird. I think it's him trying to understand because I think he had a good impression of Toki and the women in general. And he just had an experience where he almost wanted to kill <laughs> the leader of Iron Town. So he was storming off, but it's, I think this sets up why it's such a good idea to have Ashitaka as an outsider to both worlds 
of both the quote unquote civilized world and of nature. Right. Because normally you'd have like, I think if Hollywood wrote this movie, Princess Mononoke or whatever, she would be like, oh, she goes back into the human world and then feels conflicted because she actually likes some things in the humans. and She meets a cute boy. Yeah. It, but no, Ashitaka. And I think that's why you might have problems with him as sort of a passive protagonist toward the end of the movie is because technically besides getting his arm unfucked up, he doesn't really have stakes in this conflict. It's not his fight, but it should be though. Yes. is the thing. I guess the thing that I kept waiting for in this movie, and we're going to see the scene now that kind of like Mm -hmm. (laughs) slightly defeated me in the moment when I watched it. The thing I kept waiting for was for like really for really Ashitaka to make a mistake and let his arm tell him what to do. I kept thinking it was going to be like an evil dead thing (laughs) or whatever, but I felt like his arm was going to make him do something terrible. Capital T like terrible. Uh, And I was very interested in how he was going to have to like deal with the consequences of that anger, which by the way, Max, I very much feel you could argue is entirely justified in feeling something about this movie and its opinion on the, you know, environmental catastrophe makes destroys ideological ideological oppositions to me feel yeah. somewhat quaint to me. It's like his entire community of people was destroyed by this woman. No, not by this woman. By Eboshi. His his entire community wasn't. Their community is going to be destroyed because oh. he can't lead them. True. His entire way of life, though. And again, remember that quote I said from David Desser and the idea of like the juxtaposition between, you know, current contemporary time when we're watching the movie and when it takes place. If if you know about what happens to Mishi, you know how thoroughly erased from the world they are there are, at this point, Max, the Amishi are almost as much like a mythological entity as like a dear God. We don't know anything about them really except for historical record. That's my impression. They're less real to the people of Iron Town than the actual myth. Yeah, people are creature. gawking at him in the movie. Yes. You're right. Yeah, you're 100% right. And for someone to like, just like put the last nail in the coffin and be like, fuck you. I did that. Like, that is a. That is an emotion I cannot relate to on any level of like internal inferno, I guess. I I feel like I wanted to see some like acknowledge more of the legitimacy <laughs> of anger. Anger is legitimate. Like you can't you can't just be as perfect as Ashitaka is gonna be in this movie. Cause I don't feel like that's human. And furthermore, I feel like that's I don't, I just don't believe it. Uh, like, and we discussed this yesterday where it's like, I, I almost never identify with the protagonists in movies a lot of times because they're bland in movies, but also because a lot of times in modern Western Hollywood media, they're written to appeal to the stereotypical straight white man who gets the girl in the end. And that character archetype has never been interesting to me. Yeah. So Ashitaka not, <laughs> like acting like a necessarily a human would do doesn't matter that much. And also I think what's magical about a lot of Miyazaki movies is people aren't necessary. They're human, but they're also to a degree what humans should aspire to be. That's, sure. There's a purity and a clarity to a lot of Miyazaki's works that I admire. And some people in the 21st, like in the 21st century and in the bleak times we live in now might see it. That is a bit of naivete. Yeah. Naivete, but I still enjoy it. It's the same reason. Like I enjoy old star Trek and whatnot. Sure. Just, Cause it's like certainly Ashitaka is aspirational. Yeah. What if we all got along in the future and everything was great? It's like, it's like that sentiment, but, but he, I guess it's also like, it's not what I was expecting. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I, I totally agree with you, though. I do get the impression that Miyazaki is like, he'd call himself a pacifist. Yes. Probably. Um, well, you have to remember, in modern New Japan, 
the idea of even having a military is incredibly unpopular. Yeah. Their prime minister tried to bring it back recently. Yeah. And people were marching through the streets with him with Hitler mustaches, which honestly must have been an insult to the emperor during World War Two. They're like, come on. <laughs> but I, I, I feel like maybe it, it is a difference, really perhaps culturally. And I hesitate to arrive at any sort of final judgment about a lot of the details in this movie. And that's one of them because there's many things about this that I feel like could be recalling some form of storytelling that I'm just oblivious to. Right. And perhaps it would change my opinion about any number of important parts of this movie. Uh, But I do feel like as far as his anger is concerned with Ashitaka and what's about to happen, I was so ready for this moment to be like, an outburst of violence. Um, but for him to control himself, I found it kind of like, like him killing that guy yeah. or whatever. Captain Flathead. I thought he was going to stab him with his own sword by <laughs> yeah. curling it back into him. I mean, Captain Flathead doesn't really have a purpose. Like I saw this and I'm like, he's going to rip his fucking head off. <laughs> yeah. Well, and we, est- we get in this, like an establishment for that kind of violence when his arm isn't even fully empowered. before. Yeah. And now I'm like, oh, it's glowing now. Oh, God. He's Look gone out. full Super Saiyan. You need to. <laughs> That's comedic to me. I'm sorry. That's the most violence he gets into. And it's not even the violence. It's just that. Even when he's behaving here, there is no expression for his rage. You don't have to express rage with violent violence. But are you telling me that I'm supposed to like find that his rage is being expressed in temperance and control. (laughs) Yeah. I don't sort of feel that way and being like, look, this is the hatred and bitterness that cursed me. That's what he just said while he's imploring these people to be reasonable. And it's like, I don't see hatred there. You're being smart. You're aspirational, but I don't see hatred. No, but it's not his hatred and bitterness, but it should be. His entire know. world was destroyed. I guess. I, I I guess I can see that he should still be mad. Maybe he just didn't like his tribe. Maybe he wasn't super psyched. <laughs> at, maybe he wasn't super psyched about being forced to marry his sister. Like That's also uh, not true. I did look into that because you were telling me about how there's confusion over that where people mm-hmm. saying his sister. Um, that is a, a language convention thing where it seems like they refer to each other on familial terms, but they're not actually related. Again, this isn't that you, type you of anime. Know, you don't know that, though. It's that they refer to themselves that way, but there's no, like, you are my sister, we shared parents line. You know what? I guess I don't know it in the same way that, like, them cutting back and forth, this could be a thousand years in the future. Yeah. And we don't know who actually shot him. Because every cut, it max time. You t- cut is a, you're abandoning time. You're changing that's temporal not what relationships. You know what the fuck I'm saying. I'm saying that that's... I'm saying that I'm right. That's what I'm saying. You're saying you want to be right because it proves your side of the story better. No, Max, you want me to be right because then if you're right, then I have to lump Hayao Miyazaki into these weird anime sex things. If he's going to fuck his sister, I mean, come on now. He's got a tentacle arm. We're close enough already. <laughs> well, that's why he had to leave the tribe because Hayao Miyazaki is like, no, I'm not, I'm not letting him marry his sister and have a tentacle arm in the same movie. We need, <laughs> we, need we need to get out of there. We can have one, you guys. Uh, oh, my God. Talk about expressing your anger. That might have been the most dramatic way to do it. Hmm. With, that, with that scene, how that could have gone, he could have been like, guys, a thousand years, there's going to be anime, and you're going to feel so lucky that I did not do what I could have done <laughs> with these weird hate tentacles. I guess the other thing about his superpowers here is that I like understood that his arm was acting weird in supernatural ways, but I was unsure whether or not that was also making him fucking invincible. Well, I think you brought up yesterday and I had time to reflect on this. I think it is sort of like a mixture of both because you said that when they drink from the spring of the forest, God, they both felt super energized and healed. Yeah. So I think it is a mixture. I think it's a mixture of the power of the curse and the power of life in the forest God where when you have this movie having themes of life and death, forgiveness and hatred, I think it makes sense for those to be working in harmony, especially in the character that embodies sort of the middle ground of both of those. Yeah. I guess I also just felt like it was written 
conveniently to the point of absurdity for me. Where it's like, we can't think of a more clever way for him to get out of this that doesn't have him getting shot and then having to be invincible. I mean, he's not invincible. Couldn't he take someone hostage? <laughs> like, there's more interesting ways to do it that compromise his position morally. Have Toki, like, pretend to get hostage. Yeah, taken hostage by him because she likes him. and Or even yeah. have him target her because she likes him. Yeah. And then she he, knows he lets her go, go of yeah. course. Yeah. He knows she'll go along with it. I do enjoy that one shot. <laughs> the wolf just biting his fucking head. <laughs> yes. It's like, excuse me, did you just see that? He's fucking done. Yeah. He's dead now. You just carved up his head. <laughs> movie's over. We were joking that if he just had like gigantic tooth holes in his face for the rest of the movie, it would be great. Usually stuff like that doesn't bother me, but the like the fact that the wolf just like nibbled at his fucking head like that, and now we're supposed to believe his head is fine, is just suspension of disbelief. I just saw him rip his head up. Ding. <laughs> I, I, that is a ding, but also like, I literally just saw it. He just bit his head and ripped it apart. Also, but like the animation and the way it's done is absolutely fucking wonderful. It is wonderful. It's, I hate this scene the most, not even this scene, this moment, what's about to happen where he's lying on the ground and he says, you're beautiful. And she's taken aback. I know we disagree on this, but I also, thought about it more, but I hate it even more now. Okay. But also just a, just a ding. As, as long as you get a ding, I get a ding. Okay. I'm, I'm, I just realized you're throwing a rock at it like an ape. We, we saw her go like this and lift her arms up and jump back. Yeah. She has perfectly shaved armpits and she was raised and lives with wolves. Uh, That's the other thing I was going to say. He says, you're beautiful. What the fuck does that mean to her? Yeah. <laughs> what does beauty mean to a wolf? <laughs> right? That's how I felt like that moment was complete. Again, could be a translation thing. Maybe we're missing something in English. I felt like that moment was like bullshit. It's like, why does him... I understand that... I understand and kind of agree in a way with the devil's advocate argument of like, it's a recognition of her humanity. Yes. Of her worthiness to exist freely in this world on her own terms. Understand that. Do we have to express it as you're beautiful? It's like, it's just, I, that's just not what like, that is. Especially since they don't get like a lover's like. Yeah. And they're just like, don't worry, we'll meet up again and be friends. Yeah. Bye. And we were speculating that maybe it would make more sense for her to come from some sort of tribe that is potentially similar to or comparable to the Amishi in some way. Maybe she sees his dagger or some, or his arrowhead thing that he has his crystal arrowhead. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I feel like that would be a more success, like substantial reminder of her own humanity or trans humanity in some way. She's kind of straddling a line because, She's, she's definitely not, the most. She's neither wolf nor human. Yeah, but also both. Yes. She'd call herself a wolf before a human. Her name, San, um, I don't know if Japanese is different dialects. I'm sure someone has written about this. Um, San means three in Mandarin. Oh. Also in Japanese, in certain Japanese, I believe it also is three. Well, because Japanese was originally the Mandarin alphabet and then it was completely rewritten. And that was so funny. When I took Mandarin in high school, yeah. there were some people who I felt in retrospect were weebs. Yeah. And our teacher would laugh so much at them uh, when they were talking about how they felt like they could learn Japanese better because they took Mandarin. She's like, no, you made it harder for yourself. <laughs> yeah. You should have just took in Japanese. Now you're just going to be confused. It's like, yeah, some of the characters look vaguely similar. It's like saying you could learn English better by taking Russian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like you may as well just not do that. But no, I, I guess I just, I really don't buy that moment. And I did, it did occur to me like this morning, like she was raised as a wolf. She should have no response whatsoever to someone saying she's beautiful. I mean, if we want to go that route she shouldn't be able to talk but whatever i love that moment because what it's a little throwaway cutaway shot right but she cuts that vine to start doing medicinal things to try to heal ashitaka in this pool and then what happens 
the Kodama appear around the vine she just cut and they're like looking at it and it's just a stem now. Even San somehow exploits nature and displaces nature in the most slight way possible. But the fact of her exploiting it is not a moral judgment. It is the manner in which she exists in relation to it. And I think that's also another interesting part about this movie and how it plays with like, um, it's mythologizing not, of the past. And it's also, it's not saying like, because there's a lot of like environmentalist movies that come off with the message. And I think I might like be paraphrasing red letter media here, but it's like, what do you want me to do? Kill myself? Like, yeah, we exist now. Do, do you want us not to use nature? Like, Wol- like wolves and everything aren't existing in like a fairy tale land out there. Like they're brutally murdering things. Yeah. They're not right. doing that either. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, no, you're absolutely right. But also you saying that and that point being made yeah, is a key part of like disrupting the potentially sort of like, um, more harmful and like manipulative ideological, um, myths that are constructed of like a past. That's like this romanticized pastoral yeah. image. And again, I, I'm not Japanese, so I won't know the specifics. However, some of the things I've read about this movie are relating it to sort of ideas um, at the time of release, and I assume still in Japan, of uh, more, um, I don't know, accepted conventional uh, ideas of the past as being more of like a stagnant homeostasis with nature. And the interesting thing about what this movie does in how it remythologizes the past and kind of elaborates on things you would expect and then flips them on their head is that it really, really focuses on the idea that the relationship with nature has always been contentious and a back and forth relationship. And it has never been something that was like, Oh, a thousand years ago we were at peace with nature before the machines came. It's like, no, it was always like this. And it's like this for every community. Yeah. You know, because that's just a fact of living, you know? And And once you recognize that as not being a moral judgment, that's when you can actually start to engage with how you should um, in a healthy and like, I don't know, intelligent way, engage with nature. A productive way. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise it's like, otherwise you're just sort of like going into the, again, this myth of like, pastoral harmony that doesn't actually exist we're the yeah parasites we're the disease yeah it's the stupid like eco-fascist yeah yeah exactly exactly Uh, of like the coronavirus viral shit of like you know all the animals coming back which is great by the way it's great that the earth gets a little breather from like airplanes just farting out co2 all the time um but the problem is not people it's the systems in which we operate and how we exploit the land around us. Uh, we're going to exploit it regardless because all animals do, but exploitation is necessary for the functioning of healthy ecosystem. Well, that's the thing. Like, and you can see that and you can still blame this on humans, but it's a good, I love this. <laughs> Whee! And you know that like the Kodama, like got in the trees cause they know this happens every night. <laughs> yes. And like, they're just like, Oh yeah, this is the best. Part. <laughs> and they don't explain it at all. They just, they show how much fun it is. But like you can see like with invasive species and how it can like fucking destroy local ecosystems. And you can blame that a lot, a lot of that on humans with like bringing them over. But like Australia is a good contemporary example where there was like a, they had a problem with cane beetles overpopulation. So they brought cane toads over there to eat the beetles. Yep. And they did not eat the beetles, but they reproduced and there's like a billion cane toads in Australia now. And they're just, they're poisonous, which means they kill other wildlife that would try it's to eat just, them. It's just endless. Yeah. <laughs> endless displacement and chaos. Yeah. Um, because there's a, there's a difference between like harmony in how you utilize your environment and something that crosses into like, and something I was, uh, sorry, not to go ahead. Uh, just a quick little detail. When, Bear the, when the forest got, came up and the sprout brought it came up and then died and the dead leaves fell on that it's something I thought of yesterday, but didn't say out loud where I was wondering if he was exchanging Ashitaka's life for that. Eh, just plant there. That's a really good question where, cause like it, it, this movie doesn't place animal lives or plant lives or human lives above anything else. 
and they're they're all equal. So yeah, that's how you know this movie also is. It's made by someone who fe- like really sat with like a kind, like thinks about Marxism. I think because like there's a material reality to everything that you cannot deny in this, because of its in like insistence upon. It's like conservation of matter with what you're saying about exchanging the life of this plant for Ashitaka, who is about to die, right? Conservation of matter, conservation of energy, right? You can't just make Ashitaka alive. Yes. Something's going to die, right? Uh, Oh, Okoto. Okoto is my favorite, at least designed animal in this movie. It's maybe just because like the amount of facial detail they put into him, but... Yeah, I just do also love really old animals Yeah, in anything. It's a lot of fun. But no, I think that's a good point. That's a really good question, Max. I think it does also drive at the heart of, again, um, the interconnectedness of everything in this movie and how intelligent it is. But also that being a reality that we have to live with. The fact of things being interconnected is not an ideology, right? It's just reality. <laughs> You can't, you know, Lady Eboshi can't make Iron Town in a vacuum. In doing so, she's going to displace she the already, nature around her. Yes, she yeah. already destroyed this one boar tribe, which even if she thinks that she's fully successful in wiping out that boar tribe, we got another one from mm-hmm. far away that's coming and it's going to... Because she did so. Yes. Also, she destroyed Ashitaka's tribe without even knowing of their existence. Yeah. It's just everything relates back to everything else. And that's also part of what I associate with, you know, why this movie would be so, um, I guess seem like a natural analysis of this movie would be to do like the Donna Haraway type of analysis, um, where what she's very good at in a lot of her writing, which I'm not an expert on, but I always find very interesting is breaking down linear relationships that we sort of take for granted and sort of exploring about how they're sort of non-linear. It's not like a path from one point to the next, but how everything exists in a web, right? And how um, there's a lot more to the world that is that is not like, you know, ironed out in this very strict rationalist objective program. And I think a lot of this, you know, is clear in this movie, even just in moments where the dear God shows up and how this movie does the interesting cutting and the surreal imagery, it does feel like time slows down and stops. The rationalist understanding of time doesn't matter when the dear God, when we're in the sanctuary lake area, right? It could be any time. It doesn't matter. He comes and he goes. Um, This is the closest thing we get to a lover's kiss in the movie is her spitting chewed jerky into his mouth. You're telling me that's not kissing? Oh, that makes a lot of sense about the history of your love. Oh, my God. (laughs) I can save so much money on dates. I don't have to keep buying all this expensive jerky now. (laughs) (laughs) You know, the other really interesting thing about this movie that I think it gets right about colonialism and also like I don't know, just nature is um, I talked about how in the first half we're sort of setting up the different human communities. And in the second half, we're going to explore more of the different nature communities because each side of this uh, conflict is very diverse in their opinions and their traditions and their sort of origins as characters. Um, The really interesting thing that this movie does is that it does not distinguish between like colonial activities that subjugate humans and colonial activities that subjugate nature and animals. It views nature as human subjects. Yeah. And when you do that, it allows for a more sophisticated understanding of like actual colonialism against humans as well. Understands that they're kind of like the same. Also, we were talking about yesterday, just as a quick point that Moro has a male voice actor. Let me get to that in two yeah. seconds. Okay, sorry. Um, I guess the thing I wanted to just mention off of that point too, about like viewing animals as human subjects uh, who are also influenced by the sway of colonialism 
is uh, the idea that that this movie's kind of like anti-property yeah. at its core. Because ultimately, what does it come down to? It's like exploitation of resources and the assertion of your right to exploit those resources over this other thing's right to exist on its own terms, right? That's always what it comes down to. And the mere fact of like possessing land, right? What does it mean to like possess land, to stake your claim on a piece of land your, and, and do with it whatever you will? You can't do that in a vacuum. There's no way to do it. No. So this movie's like... And how can nature possibly recognize that claim? Like, yeah, exactly. How, how are you going to explain that to a bird or a blade of grass? Like, it, fuck you. It's, Which again, sounds silly when you think about it on its own, but think about that blade of grass or that bird within a chain of different relationships that always lead back to other people too. You cannot yeah. have colonialism even in just the staking of land without some sort of inherent violence that comes with the possession of property and the assertion of the right to exploit that property. So ultimately there's like this fundamental idea in this movie of like, in a way that it, I have a very limited understanding of, of Buddhism, but in a way that kind of reminds me of Buddhism of like, understanding what it, what self-possession is, but also letting go of, of a need for self-possession in certain ways. Like this movie is about reaching true control and understanding of yourself by sacrificing this sort of, um, I don't know, uh, fixation on individualism, on being a discrete entity from the world around you. Who's completely, of course you're totally in control of your own self, right? It has nothing to do with the world around you or, or the space you move through. Um, the movie is about letting go of that and therefore arriving at a greater sort of understanding of your place in the world. I love the boar expressions. Holy shit. Their eyes look slightly too big. So they look like they're about to go berserk at any, they're about to go poor zerk at any moment. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Austin, I'm going to have to fire you from this podcast. Yeah. You know what else I really love about the fact of there being different communities in this movie? And I kind of appreciate about the sort of tension filled ending is, uh, is, uh, that the lack of resolution proves that you cannot like assimilate the other community into your own. You know what I mean? Like there's not an ending where it's like we're one community now. Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. The different communities have to remain different communities because you can't you can't just like say that you're the same. You're gonna be different, but you have to respect the difference. Right? Even even with nature though, that's something, yeah, that's something I love in this movie, because you do in the typical narrative, you would have unified nature versus it, but the boars are Okoto recognizes that like, we're not going to win this. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, of course we can't beat things with rifles and bombs and explosives, but we're, we'd rather the honor of battle than sort of just become livestock for the humans. Yeah. And you have to respect the sort of Sorry. legitimacy of their, of yeah. their like heterogeneous difference, yeah. right? It's about heterogeneous coexistence, not about homogenous assimilation. Yeah. Is, is the very important distinction, which you would never get in a movie from the U.S. Because like you said, you have the setup of the thematic dichotomy of man versus nature, but all these things just become one, one side versus the other. Which in that Donna Haraway way, if you reduce everything to that dualism, it's just going to reinforce the more conservative, dominant, um, controlling logic that regulates everything and leads to further environmental disaster. But what were you going to say about something? No, that was, I think I got my point across. Okay. Now these guys have umbrellas. What the fuck are these? I have no idea. Well, they're hidden poison dart things as we learn later. Um, for a Boshi, it seems to be their armored umbrellas. Oh, that would be useful because that makes sense. They're blocking them. Um, they're blocking arrows and whatnot, but 
That's the other really fascinating thing to me just about Lady Eboshi's tactics is like, okay, everything about this movie as a historical drama movie strikes me as like the things that would least likely be in this type of movie about Japan. Cause again, we're talking about it being a genre that's about like mythologically constructing your nation's identity. Right. So what does it do that these other movies would never do? Well, first of all, it creates a history of like Japan's past that for one thing is ethnically not homogenous at all. Right. Quite different, in fact. You have multiple different ethnic groups of people. So Japan, myth of homogenous ethnic nation, not true. Um, furthermore, uh, the sort of national mascots in this movie don't appear in it at all. You see samurai from a distance. They're getting their arms ripped off or <laughs> like decapitated. Or blown um, to shit by gunpowder. By a woman, nonetheless. Yeah. yeah. Um, you have the brothel workers being a major part. You have the Amishi being a major part. Um, but furthermore, the technology that is so valuable to everyone, because again, we acknowledge that Shogun that's challenging the emperor and the emperor who's sort of leveraging his influence through Jigo. The reason why Iron Town is valuable is because of these guns, which are from China, as they say in this. Yeah. So the thing that's like at the core of this movie politically in the grand like theater of war that's going on is also not from Japan. It's from China. Well, that that's a constant theme throughout most of uh, pre-colonial Japanese history. Okay. Before they started exporting things is there always like a century or two behind China culturally and technologically. So they admired China a lot and China kind of saw them as a backwards weirdo island nation. Oh, okay. Um, so the fact that Lady Eboshi is kind of like it it's not that she's just getting technology from China, that she's actively improving on it. It's like a very interesting and, and in some ways further than yeah, than uh the rest of Japan as we see it in this movie. But absolutely in my own mind, I'm comparing it to the way in which a more conservative ideology would mythologize America's past. And it's like, of course, they would say that. We're n- this community doesn't have an advantage because of China. It has to be about Japan, right? It has to be about Japan. The U.S. would do the same thing. It would be like, even in ways that are more subtle than just saying like, we're the best, it would justify all of the U.S.'s actions and ultimately lead towards an ending that like is just, I don't know, sanctification of the state, right? Where it's like, yes, the U.S. is a valid state, built on colonial lands and uh it just had to be done sorry Mm -hmm. i do like we we see the primary differences between the philosophies of jiko and aboshi here though where jiko is fully on board with that idea we were talking about before you Um, mean the cynicism of not even the cynicism the idea of what I was talking about of the traditional man versus nature identity. Right. He's just like, she's fighting the wrong enemy. What are you doing? Let him have all of your iron for right now until we get a mountain of gold from the emperor. And then you can win it back that way. And she's just like, no, I'm not compromising my values and risking these people ever at all. But furthermore, she's not compromising her power. Yes. Either, which is why she still remains a cynical character in a certain sense they both understand that this idea they're offering of the like dichotomy of man versus nature is just a lie because they're still scheming against each other. They don't trust each other. No. If it was man versus nature, they wouldn't be doing that. And of course, like for good reason, we learned they don't yes, trust each absolutely. other. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. As we learn from her ordering the women to stay here because she trusts the women more than she trusts the men. Yes. Which is a good move against Jiko because Jiko would be just like, oh, you're bringing men with you. Okay, that's good. Advantage. Yes. Huh. Oh, Captain Flathead. That's got that guy in the English dub is voiced by uh, Bender from Futurama. Cool. Um, John DiMaggio, he does voices and fucking everything. He's also Jake in Adventure Time. It's awesome. 
I'm sorry for sharing facts. I, I didn't <laughs> mean to disparage that. I just, I don't know. I basically don't watch a lot of animated things, I guess. Futurama is one of, always one of those shows that like I was fine with having on in the background if it was night and I was have, like hanging out with friends and we were doing other things, but it wasn't a show I ever watched religiously. So I don't know. I'm like, I don't know. Do I hate TV? No. But do I watch it? Also, no. Nah, that's the thing. My my dad had his family like on a house party call and like all of his yeah, siblings and whatnot. They were all talking. I stopped by. And they're just like, oh, Max, what have you been watching on TV? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> they hold like three series they had been binging. And it's like, we've been watching MASH <laughs> again. The last show that I like really got into that was new was uh, I created a new fake email address so I could get another free month of Amazon Prime. Oh, there you go. So I could watch uh, Good Omens. But <laughs> that that was about it. So Moro just told him to kill himself. That was interesting. I feel like I didn't remember that from watching it earlier this week. I always got this as Moro sort of testing his resolve. Sure. Um, because we do get her later saying that there's a future with sound with Ashitaka. So like Ashitaka does earn Moro's respect. She never lets that on to Ashitaka at right. all. But well, also because she's right for, yeah, chiding him in his opinion where he still at this point is operating under like, I don't know, the the false assumption of like the validity of of the individual. Yes. And and like not I don't think it's that naivete. It's just that like he comes from a very small village in the middle of nowhere where they do respect nature. Like we see that when the boar god dies, they're just like they have ancient rituals for this. It's like, okay, we we will erect a mound and perform rites on the spot that you've fallen. So they have experience with this. They have lived in peace with nature. So that's his culture. And the idea that everybody else around him says it's inevitable that this has to turn to conflict would seem alien to him. And I get that. Sure. But also, I think the interesting thing is how this conversation pivots around San and yeah. how he, at, at this point... It's, it's like the conversation is him trying to, he's finally trying to come to grasp with the idea that she is not a human. Yes. It's like he still can't like quite get there. The idea that, that like, like, no, she is a wolf. Like if you destroy the forest, you're just, she's think of her as a wolf. What is a wolf going to do in Irontown? Right? It's not going to work. That's not how that goes. But Ashitaka, I don't think, wants to do that either. Like, no, but he, in in thinking, in not being able to recognize the sort of trans corporeality that he himself is experiencing, and how that, like, also relates to, like, a, an existence that violates boundaries of different species, like Sans, in una being unable to recognize that vital link between nature and humanity. Um, that she kind of represents as like a, a go between as a midpoint between them, uh, despite how virulently she fights on behalf of nature. Um, he still sort of falls into that trap of not understanding like the stakes, like which again is interesting to me because I feel like it also, based on the character we've seen so far in some ways rings like, I don't know, it, not rings untrue, but I just don't, I, I can't get past the fact of his like tribe and what happened to it. And the fact that he's exiled forever now, there's like 10 people there. Don't worry about it. We've seen more people die since this conflict started. You know, you're right. They don't matter. <laughs> just get rid of them. This is basically him being like, was this all his ploy to get rid of them the whole time? He just hated all of them. So he's like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to touch a demon. Then I got to go. Right, guys. He just saw his opportunity and took <laughs> it when that thing came crawling out of the forest. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Need to go to the big city. Big city with more girls. Yeah. 
I don't want to marry you with your stupid dagger. I want to marry a, a wolf girl. <laughs> He's secretly a furry this entire time. That, that's the real message of the movie. <laughs> I got to go to the city with the rest of the furries. Yeah. There's a big furry convention. Yeah. Rainforest 1093 AD. What? Don't worry about it. Rainforest is like a disgustingly... I thought you told me not to worry about it. Okay. You're talking about something that apparently is disgusting, Max, about furries. I might not want to hear it. Okay. Our listeners might not want to hear it either, but they, you've, they, you've said it out loud. They can Google it if they wish. Yes. Go, go look at the internet historians, YouTube video on that. He sums it up in a manner that's digestible. Oh God. (laughs) Uh, fun fact about San's outfit, which is awesome. Um, yes, I do like how her mask is, even though it's kind of smooth, it is still damaged from sure. when it was shot in the face. I just like that consistency. Sorry. Um, no, it's a, it's a good detail. I'm glad you noticed that. Um, apparently, it is uh, drawn from different reference material of uh, clothing and artifacts from the Jomon period of Japan, which is honestly much older even than... Uh, oh, God, what what is the period in which this one takes place? There's a lot of Japanese periods. There's so many. They just declared a new one, by the really? way. Really? Yeah, the emperor just declared that they've entered a new period. Why? Because he can and he's an emperor. That's what I'd do. Yeah. I'd throw things on their fucking head. I'd be like, 2020 is, listen, G- the first two weeks of January, it's going to be one. Then we got all these other things. Coronavirus, that's got to be its own. And then that five minutes where we thought there was a parallel universe, that's definitely its own. Uh, and then I just keep going from there. Because then it would, you know, validate how fucking long this year has been. Oh, no. The, well, I mean, the emperor declared it in 2019. Oh, okay. But Speaking of... Uh, I think it was mainly just to remind him, you know, remind the world that the emperor still exists. Sure. Sometimes he got to. I don't suppose he can have like a meltdown May on Twitter to remind mm-hmm. people. So you've got to declare a new age. Um, and you can't do the traditional thing that Japan would do to remind, which is invade Korea or China. So. <laughs> but uh, one thing I wanted to mention uh, after you mentioning that up, something that I read that's very interesting. Speaking of uh, more modern day Japanese government proclamations is uh, the same year of this movie. They announced that the I knew people were officially recognized as a specific ethnic group. Really? Which is very interesting to me. Maybe, I mean, that this could have been like a culmination of cultural sentiment of, even though it's two completely different ethnic groups of just like recognition of past peoples. I mean, that were erased by, you know, yeah. discourse of Japanese discourse. And I mean, we, we make movies about very, very native American tribes and <laughs> times of cultural recognition for them as well. Yeah. So. And, um, you know, what else is very interesting to me about you saying that is, Again, this is a whole research subject that we really cannot get into because the amount of, I don't know, research required and study is uh, pretty intense. But there's a lot of speculation and conversation about the exact relationship between the Ainu and the Amishi people um, because we we apparently know so little about the Amishi people that um, you know there's there's probably a lot of possibilities for for exactly the different things that happened to them. Um, but there's some discussion about whether or not that the Ainu and Amishi people s- share a lot of ethnic ties, potentially. Hmm. I don't know. You know what? This is a completely different thing. But like I said, I've been watching way too many uh, Ice Age nature documentaries recently. Yeah. You know what I found out that like, I think like 4% of humans have Neanderthal DA- yeah, DNA in them. Yeah. Which because there was like a predominant theory for a while that Neanderthals were just like wiped out by the superior intelligent humans. But like apparently Neanderthals had bigger brains and were probably just as intelligent as we were. Really? Um, so it was more just likely to do that. They had bigger builds and it was harder for them to find as much food to keep them going. So, but their DNA was close enough that they interbred with us. Right. So they just sort of literally just kind of, bred themselves out of existence and had a smaller population to begin with. I don't know. I found that really interesting. Also, if you want to talk about that, that is one of the most disturbing parts of America's founding 
is the uh, the literal changing of genetic makeups of people that were stolen as slaves by white people. Yeah. Um, horrifyingly disturbing. I mean, of course it's like, of course it's disturbing, right? But like, that that's a nice scene because based on what we've seen up until now, we expected his arm to act up and just fucking cut that guy in half or whatever. But I'm disappointed it doesn't. I feel like I want to explore more the justified rage of this young man who is supposed to lead his people into the future, but instead must leave them to destruction. I that. Something about it, Max, look, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Like I said, there was like 10 of them left. Just let go. <laughs> Austin. Ashitaka has already. Apparently he has. <laughs> yeah. Apparently you have. You, you fucking guy. I don't know. I just, the, the anger that he feels in his arm seems too legitimate to me to, to just be consolidated to his arm. And I feel like it's it can't really just be like wiped away by saying like, oh, for him not to take sides is the aspirational thing. It's like, of course, that's the aspirational thing. Or I don't even know if that's the aspirational thing. The aspirational thing is not to fucking do this to these people in the first place. That's the aspirational thing. Um, But also like something, I feel like I'm missing something in this movie where his anger is just taken as more legitimate. And I guess I'll just... I feel like I'm repeating myself, so I'm not going to talk yeah. too much more about it. But go, like, go write your Princess Mononoke fan fiction on Archive of Her Own, like everybody else does, and then you can address Ooh, that. I bet this movie is horrible fan fiction. Problem. All anime does, to be fair. But... I feel like if you wanted to make Hayao Miyazaki hate you as much as he could hate any person in the world, you, you would read him the fan fiction. Oh, you'd write like Princess Mononoke Erotica or something like yeah. that. For those of us who don't know, I think mine and everybody's favorite quote of Hayao Miyazaki is anime was a mistake. Honestly, I think he's true. Correct on that. Um, <laughs> From someone who has virtually no experience watching anime or engaging mm-hmm. with it, I think he's correct. Which to put that in context, it's him after years and years of making animated movies And there's a common theme in a lot of Miyazaki's work of the innocence of childhood and especially young girls. Sure. And if you watch a lot of them, it truly like it does capture this childhood magic, regardless of your gender or whatnot. But there is a purity to that. And a lot of modern day anime appeals to weirdo pervert otakus with sexualized young girls in skimpy outfits. And And cat ears. Yeah. And. Miyazaki is just like he's like devastated by that like he wouldn't be able to make the movies that made him who he is today in the modern anime climate just because, because again he's a big part of anime becoming more popular too right yes um, yeah but he wouldn't be able to make those today because like studios would demand that like oh this Kiki girl's pretty cute but can we give her like gigantic tits I'm talking about like big bazongas and have her short be skirter yeah shorter and listen like, uh, I appreciate Kiki but I'm looking for some honkers here. Yeah. Right. We need some real honkers. I want some tits that you could just press them and they just honk like a clown horn. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Hi. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? Oh, you made a very interesting point about this, this moment too. Um, where he goes all, all legless on yeah. these fuckers. Um, when we were watching this yesterday where visually there's this interesting thing that happens in this movie where again, he's letting his rage loose with yeah. his like evil dead arm again. Um, <laughs> and uh i love that guy who's just like yeah no i'm good <laughs> that's what i do i'd be like i'm not what the fuck are you doing like just don't just all we have to do is not leave him alone we could just say he got away yeah if the boss gives us a problem we could go find him and i'm sure he'd deal with it um but uh the interesting thing that you pointed out about that moment is how these sort of cultural signifiers that differentiate him from other people are being like shot off him yes. by these samurai. And he's being like his, his unique companion hat. and mount is being, yep. is damaged. His cloak was shot off. His hat was shot off. Yep. All the cultural signifiers are, are shot right off him by these people. And that's when the rage comes back. 
Like, I feel like the stuff I'm talking about with the rage, it's in here. Just looking for it expressed in a different way. Oh, geez. That boar got exploded literally into the mountain. We do see a darker side to Lady Aboshi here where she was completely willing to sacrifice most of the men to for sure. Yeah. Which also relates to a comment you made earlier about the women having the harder work. And I was going to sl- like offer an alternate opinion on that where it's like, yeah. do the women, are they in danger of being ripped apart by wolves? I understand they've had a hard life already. Yeah. Um, it's fair to say that in creating an independent community though, there is no easy work. And the men aren't particularly portrayed as soldiers for the most part. You have the, you, no. have, you have the elite leper force <laughs> and you have the women and the, most of the men that we see are ox drivers. Can I ask you a weird thing though? Sure. About that. Do you think it's somehow undermining the portrayal of iron town as a more female oriented society in not making the men soldiers? Do you think they're a little bit bumbling in a way that's like bumbling men are beneath the women? Wouldn't it be more interesting if it was like highly competent man no. who also accepts it? I, I think it's more that I accept it more as like Iron Town is a place for outcasts that have nowhere else in the Japanese society to go. <coughs> oh, Same. Austin had a little too much of the sake there. Um. I agree. But also, if the men are outcasts, isn't that a different thing than these women who worked at brothels being outcasts? Because working at a brothel is not a statement about your character. They're not even necessarily brothels workers. Some of them were, but also some of them were literally going to be sold into sexual slavery. So Sure, of course. Yeah. But I mean, that's not a statement of their character that... That's derived from them being women yes. more so than anything. Where ostensibly, if you are a man in this world, like also you I, could still exist in the more mainstream Japanese society. I pointed this out yesterday, but just as an aesthetic thing. One, the animation of the boars just fucking piling over each other to get up is amazing. And two, I like the fact that the boars took time to put war paint on. I think it's just a great little touch. Yeah. <laughs> and we even see them like putting it on each other with their snouts. It's great. 30 to 50 hogs in five minutes. Yeah. I had to do it. I'm sorry. God damn it. I banned Austin from making that joke yesterday. There's so many times where I just kept thinking about that while watching this movie. It's like the 30 to 50 hogs. That's what this guy was talking about. Well, yeah, like we, we like to forget because like the boars in this movie are gigantic, but like if you let pigs out, like even domesticated pigs today out to the wild, Yeah. Within like three generations, which is very quick, they will get fucking gigantic. And they will breed quickly. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) And also they're like, we were talking about this too, the weird parallel between like the behavior of the, of the boar as an animal and the pig as an animal and like weird colonizing habits of humans, where it's like, even that is kind of similar. Like, okay, these boars obviously do not listen tomorrow. (laughs) Yeah. And they go ahead and they kind of just exacerbate the situation a little bit um, because they might be a little bit pig headed. Well, yeah, if you will, they literally end up leading the humans to the forest. God. Yes. Um, So maybe if they had been a little bit more patient, but also we don't really see a lot of what you're talking about here about pigs being an invasive species in the manner you're describing, but that's still a nature, the nature of the pig. Right. But we do see them reference the fact that, they're becoming smaller and stupid. And if that they don't stake everything now, they're just going to become food for the humans. You mean domesticated? Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you're talking about too, talking about them as an invasive, invasive species. It's like, they're kind of in many ways, like an emblem, like a cat almost yes. like an emblem of colonialism, uh, where they spread everywhere very easily. They can adapt very easily. Um, Okay. They they have a quick sort of generational cycle and they are aggressive as fuck and also smart. And they can eat anything, literally yeah. anything. Yeah. So they consume, they have excessive consumption, uh, uh, every, qu- quick reproduction. If every human disappeared tomorrow and just like left everything as it is, like house cats and bo- yeah, pigs would be two of the animals that would just like were domesticated and would just instantly be fine. 
The pigs might even have an advantage over the house cats because because the house cats are very used to us doing things for them. In fact, many of them just demand it. True, but also like even like house cats that you spoil and pamper and let out, if you let them outside, they'll murder just for the sake of it because it's right. fun for them. They've never lost that instinct. <laughs> so yeah. they'd be fine. The fact that this movie doesn't really get to that point in discussing the boars, but still in its treatment of like animal communities as being human in the same way as human communities can produce these conversations. It's like so fascinating to me. There's so few movies I feel at least that I've seen, especially made in America um, that just straight up conceive of, of non-human species as humans. Yes. Right. Without even making a deal out of it. Right. Or at least the, with a complex personality. Yeah. And particularly under the lens of them being like colonial subjects. That's really one of the most fascinating parts of this movie to me is the idea of animals being much like people, colonial subjects. And also actually I want to reference another book that I might put some quotes in the, um, okay. In the, uh, it's your favorite tribe, the monkeys, They're the right. apes. We didn't talk about them the first time. I love them. Cause they just <laughs> sit there and throw shit and blame other people for things happening. Oh, I love them. They're <laughs> great. Kind of like us. <laughs> <laughs> the, the apes would definitely be podcasting. Um, but no, the book I want to reference is, uh, what is this book called? Love in a Time of Slaughters. And um, it's written by uh, Susan McHugh. And it's a very interesting book. It's about, it's looking at different narratives of like, tr- trans species relationships and also looking at them as like relationships that coincide with like colonial resistance towards like hegemonic powers. And, um, it's got some really fascinating stuff in it. And I honestly can't wait to read the the remainder of it. Um, but, uh, what the fuck was I talking about? Oh, she, okay. So she references in the introduction, a very fascinating study that was done somewhat recently trying to sort of like, like a palimpsest, like overlay a loss of cultural diversity alongside biological diversity in different ecosystems and seeing if there was like a connection between the two. And there absolutely is. Whenever like ecosystems are suffering under like the yoke of colonial and capitalist exploitation, in the same exact moment in areas around that and related to it, you will see different populations of different human cultures suffering in the same way. I just wanted to point out as somebody who watches a lot of animated things and I get why they do this. It's very simple, but like a lot of times you'll be able to tell when something's about to explode or break or whatnot, because it's obviously on an animation cell. Holy shit. That was impressive of just literally having like a fully fledged boulder that was just as detailed as everything else and still having it explode and in a very detailed manner without putting it on an animation cell. Like, yeah, there, there's a reason Ghibli is really just the king of modern day animation. Oh, I will say, um, we were talking about this movie in relation to the other movies we've done. And we talked about whether or not this is the most culturally, <laughs> cult, the greatest amount of cultural specificity in a movie we've done so far on the show. Um, I would say it's between this and the V probably. Um, but this is very, this is a strong chance of being by far the most uh, ambitious movie we've done on the show. Would you say this is the second longest animated movie ever made at the time of its release. That still might be the case. I don't know. But the fact of all of this being like hand drawn animation, I think there's yeah. a, what, like 10% or whatever that's CGI. And frankly, it's, it's CGI in a way that feels more akin to like compositing where it's like, essentially it feels like they're just stringing together different animation cells or images of hand-drawn things. So it's like, it's, it almost feels like it's just hand-drawn anyway. You're just using computers to stitch it together pretty and hide some of the seams. As you were saying, fuck that guy. He had no reason to do that. If he, if Hakoda- also, he, like, does that guy know what's going on? Yeah. It's like, whoa, worms are coming out of it. I better hit the girl who's trying to stop that for some reason. <laughs> Better throw a rock at her head and knock her out. Oh, oh, that was a bad idea. Tim, why did you do that? (laughs) 
Tim, these worms are gross. I kind of like don't want to touch them. Tim, you should let her stop you sh- that. You should have let her stop that. That was a bad idea. Also, like, if he became a demon of rage, it might like he might have just fucking killed everything around him. Can I ask you a weird question that I kind of thought about just before we started recording, but didn't really find an answer to at all? Um, like, is is the demon its own species? I would say a demon is more of like a class like God where any, but any race can become a demon. If you give, I'm just going based, I'm not basing this off of any knowledge I have. Of just past, what you observe. Yes. Yeah. Um, by in universe rules that I picked up, I'm assuming anything can become a demon. If you give into your own rage and hatred. Right. Um, but once you do, your species is almost irrelevant. Right. Like it takes over that part. Like they say a demon god earlier on when the boar god becomes a demon. Yeah. Um, Which even in the Japanese, the name yes. changes. So yeah. I, I think that by giving into rage, you're literally giving up essentially your cultural identity in the forest. Okay. And just sort of abandoning that all in the name of hatred and violence. Which that, I is think a good, that is a good point. I think that's an interesting an idea in its own. Yeah. The idea that when you give in to that like violent rage, um, you are now lo- no longer part of the thing that that you felt like was destroyed to instigate that rage in a weird way. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that in, in so doing, you're like just in abandoning that and becoming a demon, you are assisting the destruction of that community further because now there's one less of you because you're a demon now. Mm-hmm. yeah this is very interesting um and also even a kodo who now just became a demon earlier on he apologized for it and even though moro was apparently the greatest of all boars he was just like god damn it i can't believe that our tribe would produce a demon or nago yeah nago, yeah sorry um yeah yeah no it's, it's very interesting to think about it also relates to just the like trans species nature of demons i think it's Maybe it's coincidental that the boars are the two <laughs> animals that produce the demon rage thing. I mean, thing. rage, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it spreads to other characters easily enough. But, I mean, he never fully becomes one, but Ashitaka is cursed and obviously utilizes the power of his demon rage numerous times throughout the movie. Yeah. Sorry, you never watched anime, but as a young weeb, like a rite of passage was staying up until midnight to watch Inuyasha, an adult swim. Again, no idea what that means. Okay, but no, the majority of Inuyasha is just the two main characters screaming their names back and forth at each other. So it's just Kagome, Inuyasha, which I don't know. I had a, I had a old weeaboo flashback. Why'd you bring that up now? Because they were screaming Ashitaka. Oh, okay. San. Honestly, that sounds terrible beyond comprehension. Inuyasha's fun. Did we talk about the uh, etymology of Mononoke? Uh, How it's also a translation problem in English? I don't think we did. No. Um, Apparently, according to my research, it's a term that's sort of originated in the Heian period. Yes, which is actually the only era of Japanese history that I have any familiarity with, um, mainly because I the art and poetry to come out of the Heian period to this day is still some of the most important Japanese history. Um, and also I just find it hilarious that like, cause all of the art that we have, I don't mean to sidetrack your point and it's much no, more sure. Than- go ahead. I don't know anything about the Heian period. So uh, all, all like all of the art and understanding and writing we have of the Heian period comes from like the 1% of the 1% of the 1% of the elite. Great. Um, <laughs> And they were they were very self like interested vain, vain bunch, but like they did write a lot of beautiful poetry and make a lot of beautiful art. But I like the fact that the Heian period ended with the fact that like the government just became so addicted to poetry and art that like they forgot to govern the country, and the samurai had to be like, okay, fuck this, and just took over the government. It's like Prospero. <laughs> Locking himself in the tower with his books and then gets kicked out from Milan. Basically the same. 
But yeah, it is a word that originates in the Heian period. Um, and uh, I've seen, honestly, so many different descriptions of what it really means in English to the point where I'm like, well, what the fuck does it, like, can we just, can I get all of them together? Why, why are you not including all these different things? I've seen it as a mixture of like vengeful spirit, vengeful ghost, but also I've seen it described as like unknowable entity, right? So something yeah. that's beyond comprehension and understanding. Um, it is interesting too, because in the English dub, they say it even less. Um, literally the only time they say it is the first time is with like even princess Mononoke will become human again. Yeah. They say it more in the Japanese version, which then it's like an insult. It's like, yeah. it's like, Oh, look at this fucking monster princess. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The meaning of princess Mononoke is like interesting to me. Um, I've also seen it described in just Googling about it is related to like the whole like Yatsuya Kaidan type of story about like the woman who like is a ghost, but comes to get like revenge <laughs> on someone. It's like, so it has to do with women too. Like, I, I don't know. It's kind of like a, a lot of different things seem to be rolled together, but I do think some of it has to do with like the return of something that was repressed and forgotten is a key part. Um, and, I mean, kanji can have a lot of like hidden meaning or sure. just like stuff that you're supposed to know just because you know kanji that doesn't translate well. Yeah. Um, but definitely part of it that I sort of latch onto is the idea of again, return of the thing that's repressed and forgotten, but in an in a way that is dramatic and kind of violent and frightening. I honestly love the deer God. He's just yeah. so weird. He's doopy, but like it comes across as just like, I'm a, I'm literally God. I don't, I don't like have time to present myself in a way that might be intimidating to mortals. He's I'm just the, smiling all the time. Yeah. It looks like. think you're cute please don't die is it that he thinks she's cute no i'm not gonna be that cynical i think ghibli movies in general do a wonderful job of showing that you can have great meaningful platonic friendships between men and women without having to have them kiss in the end and end that way you just have to instead of kissing put jerky yes in your mouth Just the moment you referenced earlier where the dear God decides to grant them both death. Or, yes. Or peace, however you want to see it. Or life in a different form. Yeah. They, they could be a whole new kind of flower now. We don't know. It would be interesting to contrast this movie with something like, like the Lion King and the whole circle of life idea. I feel like if you did a deep dive into like the ideological implications of Lion King, it would reveal the idea of the circle of life to be like, I mean, hollow. I mean, in that movie, the mon yeah, the Lion King can be really read as a endorsement of birthright monarchy, but <laughs> I don't really want to go that. And I think any natural themes that the Lion King might have, this movie does much, much, much better. So. Yeah, I haven't seen the Lion King in a long time, but I'm gonna say it's. I'm gonna say it would be near impossible to rewatch the Lion King and find that it has anything to say that's nearly as intelligent politically is this movie much less relating to just the natural world. This movie, Hayao Miyazaki movies, I think are like very much um, from the ones I've seen, like something Disney pretends to be often. Well, they're, they're movies that like a lot of Disney movies are great. And you know, like, even though Disney is a fucking disgusting and conglomerate today and Walt Disney was an atrocious human being. I think a lot of the Disney Renaissance era films still hold up today. Um, I don't know if I agree with that, to be honest. You don't have to. I'm stating my own opinion. But I know, but I'm just saying, like, in comparison to this movie. Oh no, I'm not. When I think about, I'm not saying they're better than this. I'm okay. saying that the movies hold up as good movies. Um, but a lot of them do aim for children, whereas Miyazaki makes movies that will appeal 
to children, but also will appeal to just kind of people who like good movies. Sure. And I think that has been an important distinction between them years and years. Yeah. And also, uh, just to make a point about that, I, I feel like it, we could offer like a little bit of a comment on like the way American people tend to discuss this movie a lot. Uh, oh, I love this with the head coming back. Uh, I love set up and payoff. Yeah. I love unconnected. Just wolf heads all munching on people's arms. Oh, she took a heckin chomp out of your arm. I see. Oh man, mm-hmm. that sucks. Uh, no, M- much blood. <laughs> so, um, what was I going to say? Such amputee. Okay. <laughs> Shiba Inu, right? Yeah. It's from Japan. So Max, it's a whole thing. It all comes back. Um, it's like poetry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he was a weeb. How did I know? George Lucas. Uh, no, what was I going to say? Oh, um, this movie is still for kids, by the way. That's what I was going to say. That's the point I'm trying to make. People always talk about this movie being like, it's got, it's, you'd think it's for kids, but it's not. Cause it's got blood and everything. I don't it's think like, it's for kids. I, I hate that moniker for movies. And there are some that are obviously made for children, but like animated movies in general have that stig- assumption. Yeah. Have that stigma that like, Oh, it's for kids. So if you watch it, you have to go into the mindset that it's for kids. And even if it's a very good movie, you can't treat it as good as adult somber dramas. And I'm like, man, I'd hate that mentality and don't agree with it at all. But furthermore, it's when you go under that assumption and then something seems to subvert it in even the most simple way, like this movie, you like overlook the fact that it's like still for kids. It's still accessible for kids. Is this movie Access- necessarily accessible for kids is very different than a movie that's only for kids, in my opinion. Though. I know. Yeah. But my point is, if you go off that assumption, you then this is not the other thing either. OK, this is not like Watership Down. Watership Down is far more traumatizing to kids than this. Yeah. I don't think it's like <laughs> quite the same, to be honest with you. This movie has scenes of violence, but not more so than, you know, a movie like Lord of the Rings, which you could watch as a kid. And still very much enjoy. I think a lot of it has to do with tone, too. Um, This scene, this movie has more combat things, I think, in it than than Watership Down. Um, But the moments of violence in Watership Down are more emotionally, like, traumatizing. And to be fair, it's all cute bunnies dying, so, yeah. Yes, they're so fucking vulnerable. Mm. They can't do it. It's not like wolves dying, it's like... Wolves are just gigantic, a goddamn rabbit rock destroying boars. It's just no, yeah. it's cute little bunnies. Oh, Captain Flathead. That's why you're in this movie. Cause we needed to somebody to care, <laughs> carry Lady Eboshi at the end of it. Here we go with the environmental apocalypse. Yeah. Do you think this is on the, uh, 2020 apocalypse bingo chart? I just this giant fucking deer God comes out of nowhere. This or whatever Tim Curry's character from Fern Gully was called. Um, what the fuck even for is Fern Gully? You don't remember that movie? No. It was an animated movie with Robin Williams as a bat who rapped. It was Fern Gully, the last rainforest after like humanity has cut down every forest besides this one. And like they're encroaching on it. And just, I don't know. It came out in the nineties. It was a passion project by Robin Williams. You know, what was weird was us thinking about like, all the carbon that was pushed into the air by human activity prior to this movie. And the fact that since the release of this movie, we've at least doubled that. Yeah. That's interesting. Is he a smog monster? (laughs) Is that what this is? Hetera. I mean, Hetera is directly made by humans. What? But it has big goofy eyeballs. What now? Hetera, the smog monster from Godzilla. Oh, okay. I haven't watched the eighties Godzilla movies. Oh, I've watched, I think every Godzilla movie, honestly, but that's just too much. I mean, you only have to see most of them once and then you're like, cool. I saw that movie. So Max, you say this is your favorite Hayao Miyazaki movie. Yes. Is it also your favorite studio Ghibli movie? Uh, yeah. And what's your rank of Hayao Miyazaki movies? Uh, can I just do Ghibli just because I, okay. I can't remember. <laughs> um, I know I'll list just at do, least. Just do yeah. it. Just do it. Um, I would say this one, 
and yet again, this is my own, like, I enjoy these movies the most. I'm not saying these are the best movies. Um, cause I'm going to put spirited away several places down from where it probably should be. But, uh, princess Mononoke, uh, Howl's moving castle, castle, Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind, spirited away. And if we're doing top five, I would probably put, um, I don't, Totoro's fine. I guess it would be Kiki's Delivery Service after that. That's You're a, fucking telling me that Howl's bullshit thing is better than Porco Rosso? I, I'm saying my personal enjoyment of each movie. And I'm taking you to task for being wrong about your personal enjoyment. Porco Rosso is fine. And, um, I'd also, it's a pig. I think, I think you would really like Pom Poco if you would like the idea. What's that one about? Pom Poco is similar to this and the idea of man versus nature and traditional Japanese val- yeah, values versus okay. modernization. Cool. But it's slightly more mature in its themes and than this. Yeah. Uh, nothing th- about on par. Okay. Uh, with this, but just, it comes across like initially as like a, my neighbor Totoro, like, Oh, look at these cute forest creatures that we interact with. But then like takes a weird turn. And I think it has a lot of interesting things to say hmm. about Japan's relationship with nature. And also the, the Tanukis in it are an interesting. Oh, the thing. Tanukis that yeah. I think you see a few of them in this one too. Yes. The raccoon dogs. Yeah. Yeah, my ranking is a little bit shorter. I'd say Porco Rosso is number one out of all three. And then seen. this and Spirited Away are tied. Although, honestly, this might be more interesting than, to me than Spirited Away. Um, I guess, I again, I just get like, the more I watch this movie, the more I enjoy it. I'm glad. I'll say that. Um, I just still am like, why can't you take a goddamn side, Ashitaka? Like, I understand. I think that's the point, is that he he ultimately triumphs by refusing to take a side and it is the ultimately the hardest route for him, but it it is, it does end up being the best outcome for every faction right. because he refuses to take a side. It is interesting too, because it's now it's like it's, it's treating the human side of this equation is also suffering under the same yoke of the environment. It's yes. like the environment will mourn when the dear God is gone because of the sort of ecosystem services that the environment that the dear God yeah. seems to provide for all these different animals or whatever. I always took it as the dear God is the symbol of life. And then the night bringer, as they call it, is the symbol of death. Okay. So if you kill the dear God, then all that's left is death. So sure. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. But the thing is like the fact of this giant glob monster just bearing down on you is a great reminder that you are also an animal. Yes. And part of the environment. <laughs> And you thought you were like discreet and different and could just get away with killing the dear God and that you'd be fine. But that's actually not true. Yeah. Yeah. That's really the the interesting part of this. And also why it's interesting the manner in which he has to fight them now because it's like, again, in that way that re- kind of recalls Donna Haraway, um, the, the, the sort of comparisons make a lot of sense to me in the reading I did. Um, the binary between the humans and and the animals is not real. (laughs) Of course, us humans probably, you know, maybe it takes us a little bit of time to understand that. (laughs) Yeah. Until it's too late. We have to get to the last possible moment. Until we're on top of a rock and the death miasma is closing in on us. (laughs) Yes. All we have to do is open the box. And say, I'm sorry. But if for some reason we don't die and the sun fully comes up, then I get a lot of money. So honestly, who's to say what we should do? <laughs> Listen, it's so likely that the sun will just come up. I know we're like decaying as we hold this thing. And this is the start of the ambiguous ending. I would say it's an immediate, immediately peaceful ending with an, with a sort of optimistic tone, but like an acknowledgement that like the future does happen. Yeah, limited optimism for sure. Yeah. Um, 
limited optimism in the sense that this, okay, part of Miyazaki's goal in making this movie is disrupting Japan's like mythologizing of itself to reveal a more heterogeneous like view of the past that is more alive, more open to different possibilities of understanding history and what happened here and these different cultures that we don't have access to because they were eliminated, right? Um, there's all sorts of different things that could have existed here and we don't really have access to the to the life and activity that was going on. Um, but I think the ending speaks more to like the future of the audience watching it, where it's like, you know, much in the same way that the past was, was again, more homogenous and open than we took for granted. Maybe we can look to the future and say like the future also is more open than we might be taking for granted, but it does require action. And, and to go back to that quote that I mentioned in the introduction from David Desser, like it's just a very good way of explaining how, when we're watching this movie that takes place in the past, like you said, what happens in history after this point does happen. And also that's kind of acknowledged in the fact that this dear God is gone. Yeah. We don't know if he's really gone, but we don't see that he comes back. Not explicitly. No, but the fact that they're like iron town is completely overtaken by nature. Yeah. Like it's sort of like both humanity and nature has to start over again, but this time they're kind of on equal footing and like, I don't know. I, I like the ending of this movie. I, th I think wrapping everything up with a nice bow would be a little kind of against the spirit of this movie. I also do like it in that way, but I think I like it in a more limited way where it's like you could do a movie where you arrive at a more solid conclusion, but you also would have to take a side if you do that. I guess the thing about this is that it does resolve it, but it, it very deliberately in my mind does not resolve a lot of the underlying plot tensions. Like we were talking about this yesterday. Did any of the like political machinations that were, I don't know, leading into this grand, uh, these grand battles between the samurai and iron town, was any of that resolved? Well, I, yes, I, I'm a suit like that was one of Oboshi's low points though, is when she refused to send any of her forces back to iron town to defend themselves. But, they did end up fending off the samurai. They were fine, but they're still uh, going to come back. Right. They will, but also iron town's not really there anymore. <laughs> so I don't think they have to worry about that immediately. But she says we're going to start over. Yeah. How exactly are you going to start over? And also the emperor is probably going to die soon. So they might divert their forces there. I guess the other thing is like, okay, you're going to start over without exploiting the natural resources. Not necessarily without that, but I think in the same way, keeping it in mind this time you know what a yeah. big problem with that is though so other people knew you exploited those natural resources other people want iron town yeah and they want the iron town that you had and, and also, they'll make it again if we're gonna yeah if we're gonna talk about the future aboshi's not gonna live forever and she will die and yeah. women like aboshi yeah. did not come to be in charge of japan <laughs> yes right we know this uh and the mishi did not recover they did not survive so there's this very uneasy like, conclusion. Yeah. He can't die. He's life and death. And like in a more Disney-esque ending, we would see like a tiny deer fawn with a human face like stumbling in the woods or something. Yeah, it'd be but... the fucking ending of Prometheus. Or to lead into the Avengers or some Have bullshit. I ever told you my experience with Prometheus? I think you've said it on the podcast. Yeah. You talked, you didn't know what it was, and then you're like, oh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't understand the vitriol that came out of people's mouth when referring to that movie. I think it was mostly a marketing thing where it's like, what is the point of doing this? Yeah. And then Ridley Scott was like, eh. <laughs> Listen, just a side note on Ridley Scott, everybody. You got to look up that video of uh, Jay from Red Letter Media doing the like discussion he did on like Blade Runner and why it's fucking boring. Um, and he does the... I disagree with he, that. He but... reads off an interview from Ridley Scott about the goddamn unicorn. And uh, his his conversation in that is so hilarious where he like compares oh, himself to Beavis and Butthead. Uh, what a wonderful ending frame for the movie. It is a good ending frame. 
the magical Kodama. Returning to the forest. Last uh, fun fact for everybody once I pull up my computer. So the uh, forest that was used as reference material for Princess Mononoke, I believe it's called like Mononoke <laughs> Ravine or something, the specific part of this forest. It's in southern Japan. Um, and it looks very magical. It looks like a very beautiful um, sort of, I get to see, I'm going to say like um, discreet area. Like it looks detached from everything. I don't know if it's near a town or uh, whatever. Um, oh, the setting was inspired by Yukush- Yakushumi or Jesus Christ. Yaku- Yakushima Island, yes. apparently. So um, people go there now and they leave little Kodama things. Oh, but also, in my Stop mind, I'm like, yeah. yeah, is that plastic? I feel like he would be fucking irritated. Maybe, maybe leave, like, very, like, you, you know. Biodegradable paper. With, like, tree seeds in them. Yes. You know, they also make, like, they're expensive, so I don't buy them. But they make a cigarette butts now that the filters have tree seeds in them. So when you throw your butt away, you're planting a tree. That is so much effort to be environmentally sound while also smoking. Yeah. You know the classic saying? Save the planet, kill a human. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a that's a decent way to do it, right? Yeah. Uh, anyway, this has been the Spectator Film Podcast. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, podcasts and wherever else you listen to podcasts. No, long, just those three. As long as it's those three. Yes. Um, you can also find us on spectatorfilmpodcast.com. And also we have a letterbox that you can check out that we have all the movies that we've done and some other stuff there too. Yeah. Uh, and Austin, um, any final words? Uh, no, I'm still thinking about the cigarette thing. How funny that is. Just imagine throwing a cigarette button in the ground and you just have like three for download.